Okay, uh, welcome ladies and gentlemen to the uh, planning committee uh, being held at uh, 6 p.m. on the 10th of June 2021 um, due to uh, current uh, government guidance on social distancing and the COVID-19 virus there will be uh, limited seating available uh, for the press and members of the public to uh, physically attend the council meeting. Um, anyone wishing to attend physically should email um, uh, direct doc, uh, direct.democracy at tharap.gov.uk uh, to book a seat. Obviously, that will probably be more suited for, for the next meeting. Um, and alternatively, the council meeting can be watched via the council's online webcast channel at uh, tharap.gov.uk forward slash webcast. Okay then, so uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll get started. Um, just very briefly, let's uh, welcome uh, some members back and some new members. Uh, first of all, Councillor Lydiard as, uh, as Vice Chair. Um, we've also got Councillor uh, Watson, uh, welcome to the Planning Committee, uh, having been uh, successful at our recent uh, elections, and of course, uh, Councillor Polly as well. So uh, uh, yeah, welcome, and uh, Steve, uh, welcome back. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. All right then, so first and foremost, uh, item one, uh, apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies for absence? Yes, Chair, we've heard apologies from Councillor Howden. Uh, Councillor Ackenbone should be substituting in his place, but I know she's not here yet. Okay, yeah, no worries. All right then. Okay, uh, item two, the minutes of uh, the meeting held on the 22nd of April 2021. Uh, the committee has changed quite a lot since our last set of elections. Um, are there any comments on the accuracy of the minutes for those members who are in attendance? No, no, I've not got nothing. Uh, Councillor Byrne, you happy? Excellent, all right then. Okay, so we can uh, approve those minutes uh, found on pages five to 12. Uh, items of urgent business, there are no uh, items of urgent business. And then that takes us on to declarations of interest. Um, I don't have any declarations of interest personally. Um, there was, um, in relation to uh, the substitute councillor, Akin Bowen, who, um, who hopefully will be here at some point, um, I understand a press release was given uh, in relation to 20 stroke 01709 stroke FUL, and uh, it was uh, aware that the Conservative Ward councillors are opposing the application, uh, but of course um, members are reminded uh, to consider the application on its merits and uh, not in a terms of a political affiliation. But uh, Councillor Ackenbone will not be taking part in that uh, based on that press release. Okay, uh, Councillor Churchman, declarations of interest then? Uh, yeah, I, I declared an interest on the Spring House development uh, at the last meeting, and uh, Chair, having, acting on due diligence, I would rather keep that on tonight as well, please. Um, I don't think there are any further hands up, so uh, we'll move on. Uh, now, we're after uh, declarations of receipt of any correspondence. Um, so this is in relation to uh, if any of you have received any emails from uh, agents, residents. Um, I'll start, um, because I know sometimes these emails are circulated. So I received an email from a uh, Beverly Johnson uh, in relation to uh, item 13. That was sent just to me, but I, I assume that was sent around to everyone so I can declare that on behalf of everyone. And then um, also an email from a Jennifer, Jennifer Rayton um, in relation to item 13 as well. That was just sent to me, but I, I assume you will receive that, no? Okay, Councillor Fletcher, you've missed. Um, okay, was there any further? Councillor Polly. Uh, same, Chair, i had been lobbied by the application on uh, uh, item 13. Okay, fantastic. Via email, I've not Fire email. had any contact with the agents or anything, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I've got nothing further. Uh, Councillor Diard. I had a phone call from Stuart England on behalf of the uh, Spring House Club. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. All right then. Excellent. Okay, uh, no further hands raised. Uh, we'll go on to uh, item um, six, which is planning appeals, found on pages 13 to 20. Uh, Jonathan, did you have any comments and were there any questions for Jonathan in relation to the appeals? Uh, from you. Uh, no hands raised, I don't have nothing, so we'll move on. Okay, so this takes us on to our yearly planning performance report, uh, found on pages 7, um, or oh, sorry, item 7, found on pages 21 to 26. Um, again, looking at the uh, speed of um, the council's determination of 
determining of um, applications is obviously really high up there uh, on a national level, so that's fantastic news. Um, I've spoke to the, the officers in recent weeks in relation to outstanding Section 106 monies, and we're going to look at a way in which we can keep members updated on a monthly basis. So it may be that comes to us as a report on a monthly basis where we can ask questions, or it may be uh, that we, you know, to try and cut down the time of the planning committee that we have that circulated via email. And of course, you, you'll all have an ample opportunity to um, ask officers questions. It's just a way we can keep on top of the Section 106, because I know there was a few complaints last year. But outside that, well done to the team. This is really good stuff. And uh, onwards. Was there any further comments or questions? No? OK, then. Excellent. All right, then. So with that, that takes us on to item eight, which is a public address to the Planning Committee. This now uh, allows us to um, discuss the remaining items on the agenda. Now, um, there was five items, however, item 12, uh, 20 stroke 00, 284 stroke OUT, land west of uh, Lutton Road, uh, Riverview in Chadwell, that was uh, pulled by the developers around about three days ago, and that was a complete withdrawal. So, um, if the landowners wish to come back to us, that would have to be submitted as a brand new application at a later date. Uh, so, that's, uh, that's completely gone off the radar, which leaves four items on the agenda. And that takes us to item nine, which is 20 stroke 00, 430 stroke FUL, Coach Park, Pilgrim's Lane, found on pages 27 to uh, 42. And uh, Ian, I understand you'll be so kind to go through the report for us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Even councillors. Um, yeah. As you've heard, it's an application at the, what we've referred to as Coach Park at Pilgrim's Lane, North Stifford. The application site is located to the north of the A1306, to the south of the A13, west of Pilgrim's Lane and the east of the Sports Pitches and Pavilion. Um, you'll recognise the Sainsbury's site just beneath, to the south of the application site on the opposite side of the A1306. The, there's an aerial photo of, of the site, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And again, that's the, the site plan. The application seeks retrospective planning permission to use the site which was formerly a coach and car park as a contractor's compound. It's a temporary application seeking temporary permission for five years. The site is within the green belt. Um, permission is only sought for the change of use of land and change of use of land subject to considerations of openness and not conflicting with the purposes of designating the green belt is an is one of the exceptions to inappropriate development in the green belt, and so this can be deemed to be appropriate in, in the green belt. We have photos of, of the site, which are used mainly for the storage of items, and there's a few other structures on there which would be the subject of a separate application that would follow in due course. This, like I said, this only relates purely to the use of the land. The, um, that's the entrance into the site, which is from Pilgrim's Lane. The, um, as, as set out before, this was previously a coach and car park. The applicant's evidence indicates that there'd be a substantial reduction in movements between the 12-hour period between 7 in the morning and 7 in the evening, um, subject to conditions relating to a travel plan and restricting the routing of HGVs. It's considered that the impact on the highway network would be acceptable. As I said, the impact on the green belt would be, it's, it's deemed to be appropriate and therefore subject to conditions, no objection is raised to the proposal. Um, again, these are more photos of the site from a distance. And to summarise, it's basically what I've already said, that um, it's a temporary permission. It's permission is sought for a temporary five year period to use the site as a contractor's compound and it's recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. OK, Ian, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, so that now opens it to questions. Uh, so members, in relation to this uh, application, what uh, do we have any questions to get started? Uh, Councillor Fletcher, then Steve Taylor. Thanks, Chair. Um, the applicant mentions that the, the um, frequency of, of traffic in and out will be reduced. I was a little bit confused as to what he meant by reduced because prior to that being opened up as a, as a um, 
for its current use, it wasn't open at all, so there was nothing in or out. So what are they comparing it with? Through you, Chair. The, um, the applicant's assessment is based on if it was used, if a site of this size was used at full capacity as a coaching car park, almost on the basis of a park and ride into to Lakeside. Um, if, if that's the lawful use of the site and if it was used to that full capacity and its full potential, that's the, the baseline that they've taken and they've, their assessment is that the proposed, or the, the current use, the retros that's retrospectively sought, is, uh, would amount to, to a substantial reduction during the 12-hour period, 7 in the morning till 7 in the evening. Thanks for the explanation, Ian. I, a little bit less than happy with what is effectively a comparison with a theoretical rather than real situation. But presumably that was, also, that was the case when the original um, permission was given for the three-year. Um, for the three-year stay, was it? For you, Chair, um, permission hasn't been granted for a three-year period. This, it was originally submitted as a three-year temporary application. That was never determined. They've amended the terms of the application to seek five years. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Chair. Um, um, I, I kind of got three questions in here, which is, as far as I'm aware, the route's still not been decided for the lower terms crossing. Is that, am I right in saying that? So no applications have been put in yet. Is that true, yeah? So I'll, t I'll give you all five, if you like. It's big, or all four, it'll be quicker. Um, so assuming that the route is, doesn't change terribly dramatically from where it is, it strikes me that this isn't really anywhere near the lower terms crossing proposed route. So I'm, I'm a bit bemused why that site which is, should we say, at least not on the doorstep, bearing in mind the other, some of the other sites that have been proposed are literally next to it. So I don't, I don't quite understand why the site there. So that's my next point. And given that they haven't actually put in the planning permission yet, I think, uh, I think to assume that it will be finished in five years is being, at best, a touch optimistic. But so, so what's the logic behind the five years? I wonder if you can help me with that. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. The um, a, a pl a planning permission or development order hasn't been granted for the lower terms crossing. That is perfectly correct. There's, there's not a permission in place to, to undertake that. Um, the it's not near the site, but it is an available area of previously that used land that was available. Um, it, the, the applicant promotes this site on the basis that it is beneficial to use this site, which has had a previous use. Then elsewhere within the green belt where and where they could otherwise potentially choose to have located it or approached us to have located it the the it, in terms of the five years this this is primarily to cover the initial investigation and monitoring of, of the site and the potential route it's it's not intended to be the long-term contractors compound moving in, into the future. It's purely to cover the initial period while the investigations are ongoing onto the site. Um, and so, in, I'd imagine in due course, other options might be explored in the future. But at this time, this is only it's five years to cover that specific period of initial investigations. Thank you. All right. Uh, Councillor Piccolo. Thank, Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, I've got, can you tell me how close to the A103 the exit from the site is? Do we know approximately how close the exit from that site is to the, uh, to the main, main road? Right, that was. Uh, uh, Councillor Polly, and then Councillor Byrne. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, 
one, this is a temporary permission. I couldn't see anything about the restoration. Will it go back to a car park? Are we setting a precedent that if we're allowing commercial use on that site, have we lost that site forever? That, that would be one thing that I've got concern on. Also, as, as we've just indicated, there's a very small roundabout uh, just before the, so as you come, you've got a very busy junction with the Sainsbury's roundabout, small stretch road. You've also got quite a lot of traffic movement in and out of the, the Pilgrim's Lane uh, gypsy camp there. And sometimes that's not always sort of uh, cars and vehicles. That, that can be long caravans and things. Just wondering, what do we know what type uh, of vehicles? They're saying it's reduced traffic movements, but are we... Uh, presumably these are all going to be uh, container type vehicles, heavier duty type vehicles, perhaps even cranes and that. They're going to have to lift in porter cabins or, uh, or 20 foot containers for storage or whatever. I mean, I, I think we've had that used there once before for, I'm not sure whether it was pylon work or electricity work. I, and there was a big accident where a crane toppled over there so uh, I just wondered if we know what if they've said what whether it's all larger commercial vehicles thank you um, th thank you chair in, through, in terms of the the at the end of the five year period the use which is the first question use would revert to its current lawful use which would be the coaching contractors park um, in terms of vehicle movements, I think that primarily it, it, it would be contractors' vehicles. Um, they, there might be some some HGV, some larger vehicles, but there'd be. I think on those that have visited the site at the moment, there's, there's a large number of vans, and cars, and, and vehicles of that type. But for, with a contractors' compound, inevitably there could be quite a, a spectrum of, of vehicle movements. In terms of the history of the site, uh, Julian might know better than than I about the the pylons. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the, the site previously to this was uh, used by the M25 A13 group as their as the, their offices, construction offices, prior to the, prior to this use. But that was that must be probably two or three years ago now. But that's what it was used prior. So I suspect if it was a crane, it probably it probably toppled when they were probably loading something. I would guess. But yeah, this prior use is when they were construct widening the A13 and the M25. Okay, I'll go Councillor Byrne and Councillor Piccolo. Thank you, Chair. Just that roundabout, I don't think I've ever been on there where it's not rammed and you can't move. So this is just going to create a lot more. And as this is, as Steve just said, it's not nearly where the bill's likely to be. So we're going to have a lot of traffic going in and out, going miles backwards and forwards so although there may not be that much traffic going in that it's be going, to, going to be going a long way and snarling up that roundabout even more so is that is that going to happen is it going to make it worse uh, right uh, in terms of the traffic most most of the traffic will be outside the peak the peak hours so it, it shouldn't it shouldn't make it worse and uh, I think as Ian's already indicated that it is live that site at the moment has been operating for 18 months already so Vehicles have already been coming in and out. Same traffic Sim, similar traffic levels, yeah. It's not a problem. Yeah. yeah. Councillor Piccolo. Yeah, just uh, perhaps someone could clarify. I've been trying to find it in the report. I can't find it. Because it, it, it gives traffic movements figures between 0700 and 90 now, 1900 hours. But it also says, um, gives traffic figures for morning and evening peaks what are the operating times for the site because i would have thought morning and evening peaks would fall in between 0700 and 1900 yeah they, they would do yeah morning peak is normally uh it, it's difficult these days because it, it, it does vary from area to area but historically morning peak was eight till nine and evening peak was seven to uh, seven. Uh, 1700 to 1800. So those figures that they've given then really need to be included in the figures for the 0700 to 1900 hours because they're part 
they're, bo they're both figures within the same time period. Am I correct? Uh, well, they should be. The, the 0700 to the 1900 hours should be a f reflection of the, the 12 hour traffic, and, and then the peak hours will be the individual hourly traffic. Should be. Right, okay. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a little bit confused. I thought they were trying to give two sets of figures, um, but they, you're, you're saying that's included in. It the should overall. be. It should be included in the 12 hour traffic. Right. Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, Councillor Lydia. Yeah, I'm particularly worried about the uh, the traffic as well. In fact, um, I would have liked to have seen a, a travel plan in advance of uh, of, the, of this committee because I really do believe that there's a a, a pinch point at the Sain Sainsbury's roundabout. I, I use that roundabout at least twice a day, and um, sometimes there's a, there's a, a mile queue at the present moment and I've seen 40 tonne lorries going into into the site and um, if it's if it's going to be really heavily used um, I think we need to have a very very strong travel plan where there's uh, no traffic allowed in and out between 8 and 9 and probably something like 3 to 5.30 because uh, in the afternoon you've got the schools um, and the traffic coming in from West Thurrock, um, it, it really is very, very busy indeed. So that's, that's, my, that's my fears. Okay then, um, right, we'll very shortly go on to the speaker's statements. Um, I think it's probably one for yourself, Julian. So when all's said and done, when this site's up and running, roughly how many movements have we got? I'm not interested in times. In one day, how many moves will we be looking at? Off the top of my head, I couldn't actually tell you what the number of movements are. I'd have to look R at that. Rough idea, sort of in the, in the hundreds? or I know it's in the hundreds, but roughly whereabouts in the hundreds. I, I can't honestly remember without reading the report. No, I mean, I'm without looking at the report here. It says uh, the, the trips in the morning and evening peaks at 1,714 trips between... Yeah. A, a trip is, a, yeah. So that would be an in and an out movement. In and an out movement. Yeah. Some would argue that's two trips, wouldn't they? If, if they were being... Yeah, it could be. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not a significant amount of traffic when you look at the, the, the number of trips compared to the, the, the total number of trips on the network. And as we've already indicated, that if that if that site opened today as a coach park and a, and a car park, yeah. it, it would be significantly higher. I, unfortunately, that's we. I, I understand it hasn't been open in, in that respect, but somebody could use it in that in in that respect. Yeah. Uh, we. We've looked at the, at the figures, and the figures would be lower than it would be generated. And as I said, it's been operating for 18 months, as it is already. So the, the, those traffic movements have already been operating in and out of the site yeah, at, well, at present. Th it doesn't seem to cause a significant... Yeah, in, in the report, though, there's a reference that it's 40% of the potential capacity currently, and that's on page 36. 36. So... We're not running at the 100% the at the moment, I don't believe. So whilst it's a valid point... Yeah, yeah only, it, it, could, it, could, it could be yeah. higher, yeah. yeah. But it's not going to be as high as it, could, as it potentially could be if yeah. it is operated. And, and you have to look at that in, in terms of planning, in terms of m what I'm looking at from a highways point of view. Yeah. I would have very difficult going to appeal and actually saying to an inspector, well, I've refused it because of the, the traffic impact. And he would yeah. say, well... If it operated as it is today, the traffic impact would be significantly worse. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if it's one for yourself, Ian, um, and I'll, I'll bring you in because I can see your hands raised. But I think ultimately what, what we've got at the moment is a situation where we have a, um, we have a site and historically it was used as a coach park. And, and back in the sort of the 90s, sort of early 2000s, yes, it, it was sort of running at that heavy capacity. I think in the last 20 years, what we've seen in that area is a massive increase of traffic. And we're still sort of using a, a, an almost outdated um, uh, 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 that site. I think is is outdated in terms of because it's not being used as a coach park. I think things have. I think I can see things getting out of hand. So it's a tough one because I think if we do refuse it on access traffic, which I think is 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 a, is a, is a good concern, and, and I can understand why you'd want to refuse it. I do think it, we could get tripped up on planning law, though. Um, so, yeah, it's a food for thought. Let's see where we end up. Uh, Ian, did you want to come in there? I mean, how's my aim there? I mean, this, this, this coach park's outdated. It was outdated by 10, 15 years. 
yet we're still using that sort of figure as, as one of the reasons for potential approval. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the, to clarify some of the figures, the, the 1700 figure is the applicant's assessment based on if it was used at full capacity, which you've just commented on, so I won't go over that. The the 40%, well, they've done an assessment of how many journeys were made when they did the travel assessment, I think it was October last year. And they've equated that they've that, that amounted to 40% of the site's potential in its current use. They've then expanded that to 100% of if it was used at full capacity as a contractor's compound, and the figure was 850-ish vehicle movements a day. So that that's the that's the figures that, that have sort of tried to get across in the report. They've they've taken that site is at about 40% use at the moment, and they've expanded that and still found it's about half the vehicle movements if it was used as a coach and contractors compound, a uh, coach and car park. So yeah, no. So that that's a valid point, but I suppose from us as councillors, we really have to take on board that you, we it could be 100% at some point. And this argument of if it's a coach part, I get that, but it's not, and it's outdated. So that's that's the, that's the hurdle we've got at the moment. Um, what I'll do, I have a few more hands raised up. Do you mind if I go to speaker statements and then I'll come back to Councillor Byrne and Councillor Fletcher? Uh, right, so let's um, let's bring in the first uh, statement of uh, ob objection, and that's um, uh, Laura Blake of the Thames Crossing Action Group. Uh, Wendy, uh, will that be virtual or will you be reading that out? Virtual, excellent. Okay, uh, if you'd like to take time and, and get that set up, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Can everybody hear me? Uh, yes, thank you. So, um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. The Thames Crossing Action Group represents thousands of people who are strongly opposed to the proposed Lower Thames Crossing. The fact that this application and another at the same location have been retrospectively made on behalf of Highways England Project speaks volumes to their lack of respect for procedure, our council and communities. A government company and their contractors would know the correct planning procedure and we consider these retrospective applications to be patently disrespectful. The application states the site is already in use and provides the date of the 1st of April 2020 as when it was first used. Yet Highways England have admitted to us that this has been in use since December 2019. Neither does there appear to be any mention of any new buildings on site, yet new structures can be seen from the road. With that in mind, it gives us no confidence that the application will have any level of respect if it were to be granted permission for these applications. We would ask that consideration is given to what action will be taken if it were a member of the public that had acted in such a way. There is also the point that the original retrospective application was for a three-year period, which has since been requested to be extended to five years and further mention of up to eight to ten years. There's no clear indication in this application as to the true extent of the impact to our local roads and communities. We have concerns over the impact such a compound is having and would have been traffic in the area that already has high levels of congestion. The transport technical paper states that there will be 1,714 vehicle trips across a 12 hour day just connected to the parking spaces on the site and not including things like bus, coach and other potential vehicle categories. This suggests we could easily be seeing around 2,000 vehicle movements a day. We would also query what the proposed operating hours are for this site, as we know that HELTC proposed 24-7 construction. So we would ask how much traffic should be expected in reality, and not just the hours the applicant has chosen to present in the application. The original application states operating hours are not relevant. We beg to differ and state that the opening operational hours are very relevant and we have been unable to locate such detail. Other applications previously for this site have been refused on far less proposed traffic. We also point out that there is mention in the application of vehicles including 20 ton lorries as well as HGVs, buses and coaches which are not mentioned in the proposed vehicle movements. Previous planning applications for this site, as I say, have been refused for far less traffic movements, such as a one day a week market that was proposed and refused. The applicant states that the use of the site, parking and storage of vehicles, plant equipment and materials associated with construction of the Lower Thames crossing. We respectfully remind members and the applicant 
second, Highways England do not yet have permission for the Lower Thames crossing, so any construction until such time as a DCO is granted would be illegal. We are also unclear as to exactly what the applicant is proposing to be installed at the site and feel more detailed information should be provided, otherwise they could be using it for absolutely anything. The full covering letter, 23rd of December 2019, states the distance between Pilgrim's Lane and the security gates is just 5.2 metres. This is not long enough for HGVs, buses, coaches, etc. to clear the road and roundabout and footpath without obstruction. With the amount of proposed vehicle movements estimated, we feel this is a clear indication that the route already heavily impacted with traffic issues would suffer even more and to an unacceptable level. And as a quick additional update, since submitting our, our statement, we've been made aware of issues of an incident whereby a resident's fence post was hit and damaged by one of the LTP investigative work contractors and his excavations. The company responsible had the same address and directors as the applicant for the planning application, the IP Investments Limited, okay. according to the company's house. This okay, most certainly you. adds to our concerns the negative impact of this compound and associated works and gives us no confidence in its application. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide our statement. Oh, thank you for that uh, statement. Okay, then. All right. Okay, that now takes us on to the statement of, report, uh, of support, and that's uh, Sarah Collins, and that's uh, of, uh, the agent. And uh, Wendy, I understand you'll be reading that out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so this is a statement of support from Sarah Collins, who is the Lower Thames Crossing Land and Property Lead at Highways England. She's the agent's representative. Firstly, Highways England are, of course, mindful that the LTC project does not yet have an approved development consent order. This application does not assume the DCO will be successful, although HE remain hopeful that it will be, as we believe there are significant benefits um, to be realised from our proposed development. The Lower Thames Crossing project is, however, still proceeding and we are preparing to resubmit our DCO data this year. Whilst we're still refining our planning application, our survey program needs to be able to continue to properly inform the application. For example, this year we will still be carrying out ongoing monitoring of the water table in the area, further archaeological and utility surveys, as well as continuing with our environmental surveys. This is to ensure there is no break in the data needed to support our DCO application and is a requirement of the DCO planning process. During the DCO planning processes, most of the hearings will be held locally. Also, stakeholder liaison will continue throughout the planning processes and as you may be aware, our construction procurement processes are ongoing to ensure we can start construction if our DCO should be approved. Our stakeholder liaison and survey programmes require our team to be based locally so that we can respond quickly and appropriately. We are also looking to use this base as a collaboration space for working with our suppliers, hence the need for the site over an extended period. Highways England has carried out a lot of work looking to identify a potential site, preferably a brownfield site in Thurrock, and there is very limited availability of suitable sites, most of which were not available in the required timescale. This specific site has been used to coordinate our survey programme so far on a temporary basis. It will, also be it will also be available for immediate occupation, has good access to the strategic network, as well as good public transport links, so was an ideal position for a local base. Originally, our planned use of the site was only short-term and minor in nature, and this retrospective planning application was put forward when we, were, uh, when we were unable to locate any other suitable sites, and our plans became longer term. Highways England are mindful of the need to avoid using greenfield land for such compounds where other alternatives are available. It is, of course, also helpful that this site is not immediately adjoined by residential properties, and as stated, our movements are straight onto the main road network, which is also helpful in minimising impacts. A further planning application will be submitted shortly to clarify the exact intended use for the site, site layouts, travel plans, operating hours, etc., all of which will have been reviewed by a health and safety specialist prior to submission. Our aim is to use this site temporarily during the planning application stages, and whilst we prepare for construction, our DCO application will, will include main compound sites, but even if our DCO application is successful, these compound sites will take time to set up 
and to be available for regular use. So the five-year application allows time for all eventualities and we will then move our bases to the compound areas identified within the DCO in due course should it be successful. Finally, I confirm that should permission be granted tonight, we will meet the terms of the conditions as set out in the report. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Wendy, for that. And that's our uh, two uh, speaker statements. All right then, so we'll go for a few more questions and then we'll head into the, the debate. Um, I think it was Councillor Byrne first and then who else had their hand up? Councillor Fletcher. So Councillor Byrne, thank you. Yeah, with Laura on this, she said about everything I want to say, but this is more always England, lack of respected borough. This temporary, the agent said temporary, will we call five years temporary? That's like whole life of one kid at primary school, wasn't it? Is that, how can you call, could you call that temporary? And it's the other one, she's mentioned minor. We put in a minor parking on this now, it's turned into major. So this is Iways England, yeah, as Laura said, total lack of respect. Coming back <coughs> after the event, they're doing it anyway, but who cares, we get, we get what we want for Iways England. I think you've got to say no and say you can't take the mick out of Thurrock. Okay, uh, so we're still in questions. Just so what we're after is just questions and then we'll go to debate. No worries. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Yeah, a question for Julian, first off. Um, as uh, we just heard there, the uh, proposed vehicle movements apparently don't, and please correct me if, 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 uh, if we're wrong here, apparently don't, don't include the largest vehicles, the 20 tonne plus vehicles. Is that correct? Uh, without looking at the, the, the transport note that is, it, it, they set, then I, I couldn't clarify that at all. But I, I would assume that all, all of the movements that are submitted would be all the whatever movement would be from the site. But I, without seeing that, looking at the T, TA in detail, uh, I couldn't I couldn't actually clarify that or not. And secondly, the clearance, the 5.2 metre clearance. How confident are we that some of the larger vehicles? are not at risk of grounding or causing an obstruction in trying to take that uh, that roundabout I, yeah i think we raise concerns about that um that's exactly the same position where the gates are at the moment so all they've replaced is the the gates that were there with a different set of gates so the gates that were there for the original development that's the same position that they were originally uh, but yes we we, break, we we would prefer them to be further back within the site Okay, so we're not entirely clear what kind of size of vehicle we're talking about in terms of those vehicle move movements, and we're also not entirely clear that there's enough cover and enough um, clear ground for uh, the larger vehicles to turn. That's that's part of what I wanted to check. To say that there's enough room for them to turn is, but I think what the lady was referring for, to them was for them waiting to get on the site. One would expect that the gates would. When, if, if it's operating in the same way that the that the previous site, the gates were only closed during when the site was actually closed. Okay, but well, again, perhaps something we need to clarify. Um, the other point, the other question I had was for Ian. Um, this reference to a previous application having been turned down. Are you aware of previous applications being turned down, and what's different about this one from those? Thank you, Chair. Um, the application that was turned down was for a Sunday market. Um, I'm sort of frantically trying to find a year, but it was, a, it, was a, it was in the 2000s, I believe. Um, I would have. What, there was three reasons for refusal for that application. One of them did relate to the, the number of vehicle movements, but being a Sunday market, all of those vehicle movements would have occurred in a very short window, as opposed to this site where there, there's this proposal where the, the movements would be spread out across the day. Thanks, Ian. Okay, uh, we'll go to Steve Taylor, a uh, question, and Councillor Byrne, question, then we'll go into debate and uh, come up with a conclusion. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, Ian, just thinking about some of the words that came out in the statements, and maybe I'm being a bit too devious, but the, the route out of the site, which I, I understand, it comes to the small roundabout, then to the Sainsbury roundabout, 
is, is there a restriction that says that's the only way out? And, and the reason I'm asking the question is where the, uh, the Lower Thames crossing is proposed to go and therefore where they're doing their surveys and everything else is in exactly the opposite direction. So you'd then take traffic through potentially places like uh, Ockenden um, or through North Stifford and, and seeing the hundreds of small sort of truck things that have been flying around with Highways England on, they're going all over the shop. Um, they often queue up through where I live just to get out of a junction. So is there, is there anything that's going to actually force them to go straight onto the trunk road network? Uh, Ian, thank you. I'll bring in Julian there. Uh, in terms of the smaller vehicles, that's something we c it's difficult for us to control because um, the small vehicle movements wouldn't have as much impact. As far as the large vehicle movements, we've actually asked for them to remain on the strategic network and for them to submit routing strategy to us so that we can agree where those vehicles go. So we, we don't want them, for instance, go, them going through the centre of Orsett Village or through north through up Pilgrims into South Orchard and, and that way, or through, um, uh, lo say, somewhere like Lodge Lane to get into that area. But unfortunately, there, there are routes that, that that potentially they will have to take. But, uh, you know, for for because the, there are limits on where the HEVs can currently travel. So... Uh, it, it may be that we, for instance, something like North Oc uh, North Ockenden, we ask them to come in from the north if they're going directly to the to the site, or well, they're going to have to go a longer route rather than go through South Ockenden itself. It, it's something that they'll have to seriously consider because there obviously there are a, lots of weight limits on a lot of the roads around Thurrock. Thanks, Julian. So that brings me rather neatly on to my second question, which was. It was raised in there that they couldn't find an, a better alternative site in Thurrock. And it crosses my mind that if you look at the junction of the A127 and the M25, there is a huge site there that is a, a, a construction site um, which was set up in the Greenbelt in exactly the same way to deal with the M25. And given the location of that and the location, the proposed location of the um, new Lower Thames crossing, and I know that keeps changing, I wonder if anybody had considered using that, albeit it falls into Brentwood or Havering, I'm not sure, probably Brentwood. Are you aware of any anyone exploring that opportunity? M myself personally, no, but I, I suspect, obviously, for construction sites that are going to be close to the to the actual route, I suspect they are maybe well be looking at somewhere like that, potentially, as a, as a potential location for... To, to for the north, northern part of the route potentially, but I, I, I don't know whether they are or they're not. Thank you. Okay then. Um, so what we'll do then, uh, if there's no further questions, we'll uh, we'll head into the battle, oh, Councillor Byrne. Go ahead. When we rejected the market, did you know the movements were more or less than 1,700? Because it was rejected on amount of traffic, wasn't it? And I know that was a quite a bit less than 1,700. So. It's been rejected on less than 1,700, a plan before. Can we just make that comment? Yeah, um, and I think what Ian is inferring that the, the, the movements from, from, from this site are throughout the day. In the Sunday market, they tend to be a, move, a, a, a significant movement in, in, in at one time and then a lot of movement out of the, at one time. So in terms of the impact, it, it's, it's significant because it's in over a short period of, t of time. So I don't know what the number of vehicles are, were, but it, it's not really what the number of vehicles were. It was actually when they were cut. It, it, it sort of is, but it is, it's actually when they were impacting on the network and they'd all be impacting at the same time rather than spread out throughout the day. All right, then. OK, thank you. Um, no further questions. All right then. So what we'll do, we'll head into uh, debate. Um, I'll start, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to the uh, rest of the committee. I think first and foremost, this is uh, this is quite a, a tough one to, to, to start the year. I can uh, even right now, I'm, I'm not 100% sure which, which which way to vote. I think first and foremost, we had the training last week, and and, and the training told us that look, we, we know we've got a rocky history with with Highways England, but you know the the history of the applicant is is not 
to be in, uh, as part of our, our decision making process so it's really important that the decision that you're about to make almost has, has, has nothing to do with Highways England albeit it, it's sometimes hard to, to kick that out because you're looking at the practicalities of the five year temporary stay I mean let's be realistic it, it probably will not be five years it, it, it will probably actually be ten years and I think that's being reasonable um, and that's of course if, if the project goes ahead um, there's a little bit of a technicality that we're up against, and that is this uh, this pain in the backside, which is the, the 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 coach park and its operational movements in the in the 90s. I think we're looking at it practically, and practically tells you it's too much. It's too much in this area. Um, but I think, unfortunately, what's working against us at the moment is if this was to go to appeal, uh, I generally find that appeal inspectors don't look at things practically they look at things in, in planning law and planning law tells you that if historically those sorts of movements out of the site were okay um, they should be okay now now it could be um, if, if it did head to appeal that the inspector looks at it and goes actually you, you guys have got a point this is a very outdated uh, uh, site it, whilst we're using the coach park in our figures actually it's not been used as a coach park in many years and the and the area has built up very much so that's what makes this incredibly difficult um, our professionals uh, that, that have to be taken seriously have told us if you reject it um, you know they're going to have difficulty um, uh, fighting this one on appeal which could mean if we do reject it we could be looking at fines so look we just need to be aware of that um, but, it, but it really does come down to that practicality of is this too much in this location um, so as, lo as long as you're all aware of that I'm, I'm really interested to see what you think on this one but um, yeah I think it's, this is one of those ones where I, I'm minded to reject it because that is clearly too much but I'm also aware that um, I'd be very nervous uh, doing that because I, I, I'll be honest with you I do think that that technicality is, has put us in a bit of a corner so as I said, I, I'm, I'm really interested to hear what you say because I'm, I'm still not sure which way to go. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Lydiard first and then uh, we'll open it up. To the yeah, floor. like yourself, um, it, is a, it is a difficult one. I'm, I'm very concerned about the, the traffic. If I could see the, uh, the, the travel plan now, I'd, I'd feel a lot more comfortable. Uh, I don't, don't really understand the logistics of having a, a depot five miles away from the uh, Lower Thames crossing. I'm sure there's a, many places a lot nearer, and I can think of the Renault garage um, by the Orsic Clock uh, and various places like that, and the compounds that uh, were planned in the early days, in, in the early LTC plans. So um, it's, it's very, very difficult for me. I, I want to make sure that the travel plan is um, checked by councillors. So I may, may go for it, approve it, but really make sure that uh, these 40 tonne lorries aren't moving around between eight and nine and three and 5.30. Okay, thank you. Uh, go to councillor Burning Fletcher. Yeah, to talk about coaches and impact on movement. Coaches back in the day dropped their shoppers off at 10 o'clock, parked there all day and then picked them up at 9. So there was actually no day movement, was there? It was out of, out of peak and out of peak. So that's just a red herring from, again, from Highways England. It's, it's not relevant, is it? Because the coaches didn't move during the day. They stayed there. Stayed there for 12 hours. The other thing, talking about fines, do I dare say, go to Secretary of State, he might just... Click his fingers and do it. Remember that one from last year? Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd have to say personally I'm not against the idea in principle, but I totally agree with, I think, all my colleagues who've spoken so far that the key to this is the travel plan. The, uh, not so much the, it's not so much the volume of traffic, it's the size of traffic, and I think point we haven't mentioned so far is it's not just so much the Sainsbury's roundabout we're talking about here it's Pilgrim's Lane um, my ward in uh, in in Bellis and um, the ward next to it in Ockenden people there are very familiar with the problems they get anytime the bridge goes down anytime there are pipes problems 
Uh, next thing, you've got the road equivalent of a trek across the Sahara just to get in or out of the village. This, potentially, is inviting more blocks, more problems, unless we can manage the flow of traffic in and out. So I think for me, exactly as, uh, as Councillor Lydia has said, the key to this whole thing is the travel plan. And without seeing what the travel plan proposes and how they propose to avoid large amounts of heavy traffic at critical times, I don't think I can say yes. OK, thank you. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Polly, then um, uh, uh, Councillor Pico. Uh, Councillor Watson, did you have your hand up? Yeah. OK, uh, Councillor Polly, Piccolo, Watson. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I find the application premature because we, we don't know the outcome of the uh, uh, Lower Thames crossing yet. So to be putting in an application for a compound for something that hasn't been approved yet, I, I think it's premature in nature. Uh, that uh, I also am aware of the smaller roundabout by the entrance to the uh, Pilgrim's Lane a residential site there. They, they've just been dismissive of the residents there, s suggesting they're not close to any residential uh, facilities um, when they are actually dead opposite uh, a residential uh, facility. The, the roundabout's already showing some sides of signs of subsidence. That's all chalk round there. Heavy, a, a, a lot of heavy the HGV movements on that roundabout, I would have a real concern uh, structurally if that could cope with it, and I think we could be. So um, I'm echoing uh, other um, members' comments. Uh, obviously, Councillor Fletcher and I share uh, the wall to Bellis, and uh, the, the, at the moment, those traffic movements along by the Sainsbury's roundabout, as Councillor Lydiard has identified, are are already causing tailbacks and we're still in lockdown. June 21st hasn't happened yet. We, we, we're not, we, we've still got reduced traffic movements out there and we're encountering problems. One, once hopefully the roadmap is, is um, a tier two and, and we, we, all the restrictions are lifted, I, I feel that, that those traffic movements will be even more significant. So. Uh, I agree that we, without the tra uh, transport assessment plan uh, and the detail, the meat on the bones, we, we don't yeah. know what we're approving. So yeah. I've got reservations. Thank you. Okay. No, no. So it's all, all, all very valid. Um, right. It was Councillor Piccolo, then uh, Watson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I th one thing I think I'd like to clarify is that you know, it's been mentioned about um, the traffic movements um, comparisons with what it was when it... Uh, 20 years ago, well, I would suggest that Lakeside and the housing developments and everything else around there has moved on leaps and bounds since then. So I think any comparison to a traffic plan that was 20 years old is completely irrelevant. It needs to look at what the traffic situation is now. And I don't see how uh, any inspector um, could justify comparing it with something um, that's 20 years old when the area as a whole uh, has been developed so much. Um, <coughs> There's also talk about the, the operating over the last, last 18 months. Well, there's been very little really going on other than a bit of explore, uh, exploratory work and some testing. But there's not really been anything happening for the last 18 months. So you can't really take the, in my view, the movements in the last 18 months to be representative of what it will be if it does go ahead and it gets in full swing. And I think my other perhaps final point, is I believe the exit is far too close to the A1306. Um, vehicles coming out of the site that want to turn right will quickly block. Um, if there's a bit of traffic on the, on the, on the uh, roundabout, um, the vehicles coming out of the site are quickly trying to budge in and block the, uh, the approach road. So it will cause even worse traffic congestion um, than what there is at the moment. So it's the access that I've got the major problem with. I don't think the access is appropriate and I think it will cause major traffic problems. If it was controlled by traffic lights or something like that, it may be different. 
But at present, you know what, um, and I don't want to put HGG drivers down, the vast majority can do a very good job. But as soon as they see a gap they can, they can get in, they'll nudge out and get in it. Doesn't matter if it stops the cars going in the other direction, they just need to get to the next destination. So I say, that's my main concern, is the, uh, the, the, the way it's coming out. If it's not controlled, it needs to be somewhere further away from that roundabout. Uh, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Chair. So I probably echo everything that everybody else is saying, really. But um, the thing that worries me is the traffic, because it's seven days a week there. It's not just between nine and five on that roundabout, but because of Lakeside, it is literally seven days a week. It is absolutely full on. I also am really worried about the amount of lorries that's going to go through, especially through Ockenden and Bellas. The roads weren't designed for those lorries, and they're going through there now. So I think going forward, it's really difficult what this is going to do. And I think unless you've got a very, very robust travel plan, I feel very uneasy making a decision right now on what we need to do. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, it is a tough one. Okay, so um, I think that's almost everyone. Uh, there's no other hands raised, so um, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's come to a conclusion. All right then, so yeah, um, I, I can understand this one. It, it is tough, it is tough, it's, it's not easy. Um, I think these east facing slips or, or the lack of them are, are really killing us around this area. I know they're on the radar, but they just they, they, they can't get here soon enough. Um, I think uh, generally, I mean, we come in here open minded, um, uh, I, but, but you know, you always have a rough idea, you know, sort of what direction you may sway in. I, I generally come in here thinking, no, there's, there's, there's nothing material here to, that we can use. But actually, listening to the discussions, listening to you, I think, I think the right decision is actually if, you, if you're in doubt, then um, it, it's better to be safe than sorry. Now, I, I, I appreciate that, um, I appreciate that the, the officers uh, are, are going to have difficulty with this on appeal, but I do think, based on, on what you said, Councillor Piccolo, in relation to the actual access and traffic plan, and with the, with the, uh, the, the outdatedness of this coach park, I, I'm hopeful that if it did end up there, that an appeal judge would look at it and, for a practical term and say, actually, yeah, there, there are problems around here. So um, I'll bring you in, John. Um, we'll, there is a recommendation, and I know um, at least one member may, may support that, so we'll, we'll go to that first. Um, John, would you like to come in? Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on a few points that members have all made this evening, and I appreciate it is a, a challenging decision for you, particularly being the first item on the agenda on the first new committee. Um, I think a number of points have been raised I think the key one is the, the fallback position that it has got consent for Coach Park, so the use could be um, could carry on as a Coach Park if if the use, this use wasn't here. The Coach Park could carry on with the access as existing and could have vehicles running in and out all day. Um, what we have got on the recommendation, we've got condition two, which is the travel plan condition, um, and if the wording is written very tightly that if a travel plan isn't submitted within the two-month period, then the use would have to cease. Um, travel plans would then come in, would be assessed by the highways team, the Julian and colleagues, so that which would give members assurance that the, the practices that would be adopted on the site would be acceptable. Um, the second highways condition, which is condition four, is HGV routing. And I note members' concerns about vehicles heading up north Pil into Pilgrim's Lane through Ockenden. Um, we would have a robust robust plan on that, the HGV routing to use the strategic road network so you wouldn't end up with the lorries going through the small, narrow roads, which isn't acceptable. Um, also note members' concerns about the, the continued times at which vehicles could come in and out. Um, one option might be to put another condition on limiting the hours of oper use of the, the access by HGVs to certain times of the day so it didn't meet the morning rush and didn't meet the evening peak. So you could control it through the quieter part of the day when there'd be less likely to have queues. So just a couple more points while I've, from what I've noted. Um, I note members' concerns about the, the location of the site. Um, I think one of the benefits to this is it's an existing established site within, within this location. If the use didn't take place from here, it'd be likely that there'd be another application in the future um, for something similar, which might be an incursion into the green belt. So with this site, you've got a ready-built access, which we know can accommodate vehicle movements. 
that's, uh, that's another thing that we need to consider in the, the overall balance. I know members have made a number of sort of concerns about refusing it and the, the inspectorate's decision, um, potential decision. As I said, the fallback position is there are, it could be a coach park with vehicles running in and out, um, and we have scope within this application, within the conditions to, to limit the vehicle movements, the times of movements, where those vehicles go to control those on the network, which should give you some comfort that this is something that, that could be acceptable subject to those conditions. Um, so those are the main points I brought out from, from that debate and discussion. Yeah, no, thank you, John. Um, yeah, no, you, you've pretty much summed up that that well, um, and, and it, it is a tough one for us. It really comes down to, yes, I, I, we, we get that it, it could be a coach park, but in, in reality, um, uh, if, if, if is that actually going to happen? But even if it did, I mean, that's that would be something that was was already in in in, in the uh, in agreement with Forest Council. So um, you know what we're agreeing to here is is something new. Uh, something a little bit more permanent, albeit it is temporary. So, um, yeah, I, I, I take on board what you're saying. And this was this is what makes planning difficult. Um, as I think there's a couple of hands raised. First of all, Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Piccolo. Did you have your hand up? Cheers. Just a quick question, Chair. Um, thanks, Jonathan, for, for, for that summary. I think you, you, you hit, it, hit it on the head. Were we to approve this uh, subject to a travel plan, as I understand it, uh, it would go to Julian's team, would it come back here? Would we get to see what it is we've actually approved? We wouldn't. We couldn't bring a conditions application to the planning committee, but the it would be a public document, so you would be able to. It's a document you'd be able to see what was what had been proposed and what was being considered. But it's not a planning application that requires consideration by members. But it, it would be a published document that you could see. Yeah. So you could you could potentially write in. It would go on public access everybody would be able to see that, that document and you would be able to sort of make comments on it. Okay. So as I'm sure you understand, what we were effectively saying is we would be, if we were to approve this tonight, we'd be approving it in the hope that whatever travel plan comes back meets our needs. Yeah, but we, obviously Julian and the team have taken away your points and the the meeting's being webcast, so the, the applicant would see what your concerns are, and they would be able to address those via the travel plan, because the travel plan would be tied to the planning application. There would be a route for enforcement if those measures weren't met. So um, by including that as a condition, we could potentially enforce if, if those weren't met in the future. So there is a recourse to you and to the, the members of the public via those conditions. Councillor Piccolo. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, 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 it appears that the main problem is the, is the travel plan, and, and my biggest concern, I say, is um, blocking the, the, the road up with some possibly inconsiderate HG drivers just trying to get into a queue and, and causing further gridlock. Um, is there any possibility um, that we could make the access uh, or the, ex the, the exit, exit from the site um, traffic, con traffic light controlled. Now, whether that be the applicant that supplies that or whatever, so that at least we can, we can stop and uh, whether or not that we can ask the applicant. I don't want yeah, to I mean, defer something. Yeah, I mean, these are valid points and, and they're the things that can to yeah. be picked up. And if, if that's what your concern is, yeah, I'm sure that's something that can be looked into. Me personally, don't matter if you go left or right, it's clogged. <laughs> um, so the traffic lights, if anything, I, I, I can't see them helping the situation. Oh, but look, I get what you're saying. I'm talking about stopping the vehicles, HGVs coming out of the site if there's already if the main roads already congested, so they don't add to the problem. <laughs> there's some yeah, sort of gate control. Yeah, but I mean, but I don't. The, it's the only way that I can see is it being acceptable. Is if they if you find some but, but way. What, what, of, what is congested? what is clogged up, the, the, the bridge shutting, or, well, well, because that gets clogged up at school time, so then do we, do we stick the traffic lights yeah, up at school time? Uh, well, I, I don't, I, it just I, gets murky, doesn't it, if we start entering that well, but I get, I, I get what you're saying. I, I think people understand what I'm trying to get to, hopefully, is that, you know, you, if you know this, if there's 20 cars to your left and you want to turn right, 
that's congested because you're going to pull out and the chance of someone let you in is not going to happen. I'm just saying the, ac the access from the site, in my view, to make it work properly and acceptably should be controlled in some manner. But uh, obviously I'll leave it up to the rest. Of the you have, sorry, we have had sites where we've had conditions in the past to have banksmen or people on the, the gate, sort of gate control. So that's something we have used in the past, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Byrne, Councillor Polly, and then Steve, and then we, we need to, I think, come to a conclusion. So really tonight, we're being asked to vote on something, but we don't know what the outcome's going to be. We, we don't know what the plan's going to be, so I don't see how, how anybody can vote yes for a plan that we don't know what the traffic plan's going to be. Can't we job it on till we know? Well, look, I mean, potentially, um, yeah, we, as I said, we've got problems... I think around the corner if we go to a pill, but there's nothing stopping them coming back with something a bit more updated at a later date. But whether they choose to do that, I don't know. Uh, Councillor Watson, was your hand up? Yeah. Yep, sorry. Can I just ask one question? So we're obviously in an agreement that we need a really robust travel plan. Is there a way we can defer this until we see that travel plan? Um, because we're not comfortable on making a decision until we see this travel plan. Councillor Polly. Sorry, Chair, that was exactly my point. That, that, yeah. um, it, that this, the, as this is a retrospective application in its nature, so it's not time critical in, in, in that respect, I, I think it would... That, that would have been my question to the officers, that, that we defer it until the, the detailed travel assessment plan is available to us. Thank you. OK, then. All right, then. So, um, yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, sensible for, for the time being. Steve, your hands up. Yeah, yeah thanks, Chair. <coughs> Just playing devil's advocate, given that the problem is a problem that is Highways England problem, and looking at that picture, it strikes me that's a very short distance between the M25 and that site. Yeah. Let them deal with their own issue. Uh, yeah, no, very good. All right, then. Um, OK, then. So let's, uh, that, that was a good debate there. Um, what, what I'd like to do before we even head to the boat, then, there was a, a recommendation of a, a deferral for a more up-to-dated uh, travel plan. That was from uh, Councillor Lee Watson. Uh, is that seconded? Uh, there's not hands there. I'll go to Piccolo as I saw you first. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's see what's uh, around the corner on this one then. Um, all right then. So, John, are you happy for us to go to the vote there? Yeah. Ian, you happy? Yeah, excellent. Okay then. Okay, so all those in favour to uh, defer this item for a later date for a more up-to-date travel plan, please raise your hands. That's perfect. And uh, that's uh, unanimous, Wendy, across the committee. Are you happy with that? Yeah, brilliant, excellent. All right then, thank you. Thank you, everyone. That's a, a good debate. All right, so that takes us on to, um, oh, sorry, just to confirm, Coach Park 20 stroke 00430 stroke FUL um, uh, has been deferred to a later date. All right then, so um, let's go on to item 10. And that's the Springhouse, uh, Springhouse Road, uh, 20 stroke 0052592 stroke OUT. Um, are you, sorry, Councillor Treasman, you're just going to Lou, are you? Yes, oh, oh you're, not, you're not taking part, are you? Sorry. Something so weird. Uh, I thought he was coming back. I thought he was going to miss it. Um, okay, right, so Springhouse, uh, Springhouse Road. Chris, would you be so kind as to present the report? That's item 10. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, so this is the Springhouse um, site, uh, Springhouse Road, Corringham. The application, um, as some of the members will recall, was on the planning agenda for the 7th of January planning committee, but it was not determined or debated as members requested the need to undertake a site visit instead. The committee site visit took place yesterday on the 9th of June 2021. This application seeks outline planning permission to determine access, layout and scale with the matters relating to appearance and landscape informing the reserve matters. The proposal is for the construction of four blocks of residential dwellings, uh, apartments they are, totaling 95 units with an associated access internal road and parking area. 
The erection of a new sports and social club with associated facilities including a bowls pavilion, a bowling green and patang courts and associated facilities including parking to the front of the site. The existing sports club and all associated buildings would be demolished and the existing hard standings removed. There would be two new vehicular access points to the site from the main road, one for the residential part of the site and the other for the new sports and social club. The existing vehicular access points, there's, there's two of them, there's an old one as well that makes a third one that's not being used, will all be closed up. So just turning to the uh, presentation and the slides, so we've got the uh, red line there showing the um, application sites. Um, the next one shows a bit more zoomed in and the existing layout of the site in terms of the footprints of the buildings, the, the bowling green to the uh, sort of west of the, of the site there. Uh, the main building in, in the central part of the site. Sorry, Councillor Churchman. Can you write to see in the gallery? Sorry. Sorry, it's been instructed. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and uh, you've got the main building in the, in the centre of the site. There's an old badminton court building. That's towards the top part of the site, right at the red boundary line, uh, closest to Central Avenue to the northwest. Uh, and the area to the southeast is uh, has some container storage. Um, the Red line goes through the middle of the site there, so the, the red line being the application site, the, the, the area where the planning application is for. The area to the east or um, is outlined in blue. Uh, that also forms part of the um, applicant's land holding, and they are in control of that, but that's, that field, as it is, it's a green field, is not part of the um, application site. Uh, and this shows it a bit clearer from a Google Earth or aerial photo to give you an idea of, of those uh, boundaries in the site application area. And this is a helpful uh, sort of bird's eye image looking sort of west, sorry, looking east rather, uh, of the buildings. And you can see the large field uh, just outside the site, as you can see from that, that image as well. It's useful to, to see Central Avenue and the residential properties there. And you've got uh, residential properties directly to the west along Springhouse Road, but this is also a site very close to Corringham Town Centre where there's a lot of multiple uses. Immediately to the uh, to the south is the recreation field, uh, an area of public open space. So some photos of the site, as, uh, as you can see, looking at the front of the site, the, uh, the buildings, uh, as you can see, mainly single storey. There are some two-storey elements as well. Uh, some existing photos. There's a, the car park uh, covers the entire frontage of the site, but also a larger area sort of to the south west part of the site as well uh, and this gives you an idea of surrounding buildings so you've got uh, buildings uh, on the opposite side of the road and the bottom pictures there Dove Court is the one to the north uh, which is near to the, the pavilion and the, and, the bowl, and the bowling green as it stands and that shows uh, pictures of the site um, in terms of the bowling green to the top there and that's uh, looking at the field to the, to the uh, rear, and there's some more photos uh, taken from the applicant's details of, of what's in the site. There is a, a play area in, in, a, in the back of the social club uh, and various other uses associated with that. So there's also changing rooms, um, which can be seen from you know, part, part of access from this photos as well. So turning to the proposal itself, so the proposed layout um, shows uh, the site to be divided. Um, the new sports hall and associated uses are located to the right of this slide. As you can see, there's a, there's a building with some solar panels showing. That's a sports centre, uh, including a new badminton hall, parking to the front, uh, and then you've got the bowling green to the rear. You've then got four blocks there, which are residential blocks. I say largely residential blocks. Uh, in the bottom of blocks, uh, block B, which is the one sort of centrally within the site there, is the bowls pavilion and indoor bowling facilities, including a, a basement area as well. Uh, most of that's on the ground floor, but there's a basement facility for that as well. And in block D, which is uh, directly in front of that, uh, again, central part of the site, but nearest to the, um, uh, the highway, there is a gymnasium proposed on the ground floor, along with um, a studio room as well, uh, with all the residential uses being at the upper levels of that building. Uh, the other buildings, there's residential uh, at, at all levels uh, and they go up to four storeys in height uh, in terms of the scale. 
Uh, and this gives you a bit more zoomed out with the proposed layout shown uh, in relation to the site and as you can see the sports area as, as well as sports field to the rear. Now as I say this is to consider access layout and scale. Um, so that shows the scale of the buildings up to four storeys in height as I mentioned but the appearance uh, can only be considered as indicative at this stage. The appearance and the landscaping would form what we call reserve matters and therefore would be subject to the subsequent follow-up application to determine those, those matters uh, and only those matters. Uh, and this is the layout uh, so of the layouts of, of one of the apartments is Block A um, that shows you that arrangement. Block A is the one to the rear of the site but to the, towards the northern boundary, um, which is why also because it's nearest properties uh, in terms of Central Avenue uh, at the top floor level, the, uh, the fourth storey, if you like, the, the top level is set in a way so it doesn't project all the way across the building and nearest those properties, so it's only, it's only uh, three storeys at that point. Uh, some indicative appearances of the sports hall to give you an idea of what that could look like. And that's the layout of the sports um, centre. So you've got a badminton court shown in this part of the site and then you've got a snooker room here and there is a kitchen in the middle and then there's various function rooms and on the ground floor a more open plan bar and social club uh, use. Uh, on the roof again there's uh, that's that's the uh, the badminton hall but also um, solar um, PV units are proposed in terms of energy, uh, renewable energy provision and things like that. This shows the um, block B and shows the uh, ground floor um, pavilion which is this area in the central part of the uh, of the slide uh, with some changing areas and things like that and then on the ground floor there's some further bowling areas as, as well uh, in terms of indoor bowling courts for so when the weather's not good enough to play outside. Block, block D I mentioned the, um, the gym which is here and then you've got the, the um, studio room uh, and then you've got other, you know, got changing rooms in the in the ground floor there, but also cycle facilities, uh, and that's a feature for all the, the apartment blocks as well. They've all got secure cycle facilities <coughs> and refuse facilities within the confines of the buildings, rather than being outside as as they can be on, on some some applications we see. Uh, and then just give you a bit of assistance uh, in terms of what remains on the sports field at the moment, as uh, as some of you saw from your site visit yesterday, the um, the sports pitches aren't laid out and they, ha they are not being used at present for that purpose. The grass was quite overgrown, uh, but they, I mean, yeah, the agent informed us that they were used about five years ago. Um, so they could still be used for that purpose of sports as a football pitch. And this plan shows you that you could get a, a full size football pitch and a junior pitch on that site. Um, and that's important because um, Sport England are part of the consultation process for this. And, you know, one of their main considerations is ensuring that there's no sports facilities lost with these types of applications um, and there's not there's obviously benefits although the land use is um, uh, is making better effective use of land in terms of bringing the sports center into one one smaller building there's still prov provision of the, the bowling uh, green which is the same size uh, and you've got additional facilities like the batang and the indoor bowling which the site doesn't have at present so the next slide um, shows you some of the street scene uh, images so but the top one being, if you were to stand in on the western side of Springhouse Road, you'd see, uh, potentially see this this layout. So potentially because it's indicative in terms of appearance again, and the bottom ones from the rear. So if you were looking across the uh, across the field towards the rear of the buildings, that's what they would appear. Um, and then we've got some helpful sort of 3D drawings to show uh, the blocks of flats and the sports hall, sports um, pitch to the rear, uh, and then there's another angle or version of that shown there car parking to the front for the sports hall and there's parking in between the uh, the blocks of flats um, for the residential uses um, and there's also um, parking shown on this plan there to the um, to the front of the sports hall and there's some parking in front of that's the block that fronts onto the it's block c uh, which is sort of the most westerly building so the application is recommended for approval. Um, this summary slide just highlights some of the key aspects. Um, so this proposal would allow for existing the existing ageing sports facilities which are probably more than 50 years old now 
uh, to be replaced with a purpose-built modern sports hall development and associated facilities. It would introduce a, a residential element to the site, um, but that is necessary because this proposal is what we call enabling development, so the residential element is needed to fund the replacement sports zone social club facilities. And it's important to recognise that because if there wasn't a the residential element, uh, the applicant wouldn't be able to provide these replacement sports and social club facilities. The proposal in terms of the res residential aspect would provide more dwellings, which is beneficial to the council's five-year housing land supply, and importantly would provide a policy compliant level of affordable housing. The site, as I mentioned, provides um, benefits from a sustainable location. It's with an easy access, walking access of uh, Corringham Town Centre. There are, of course, nearby uh, bus routes and is easy to cycle around this part of um, the, um, this part of the urban area. So it's, uh, it, you know, it's therefore accessible by a, a range of transport means and modes. Uh, and visually, compared to uh, the photos I showed you earlier in terms of obviously the dated appearance of, of the site and the parking dominance of the frontage, the proposal would lead to visual improvements to the site and the immediate surrounding area. All other material considerations are considered acceptable, subject to conditions and planning obligations when necessary. The report is structured with two recommendations, and I'll just clarify that, uh, why there's two. Recommendation A is to deal with... Um, what we call the um, zone of influence where uh, European sites, uh, in terms of the habitat regulations, the local authority is required to um, undertake a habitat regulations assessment, and that's in the report uh, a few pages before the recommendation, uh, and that assesses the impact of the development on the likelihood of significant effect on a European site, that being the Thames estuary, recognised for its wildlife uh, and mainly obviously birds and things like that. So its zone of influence extends inland away from the coast uh, and most half of Thurrock is covered by, by this, uh, this zone of influence um, and that's where the um, Essex Rams payment as, as recognised in the recommendation comes into it uh, as a mitigation measure. And whilst I mentioned the Essex Rams payment, um, the payment has slightly increased as a result of the new financial year. So what's in the report has slightly increased from the £11,930 and 10p, the new payment is £12,093.30, um, and that's something that's agreeable to the applicant along with all the um, uh, other matters, and I'll come on to that next. So the recommendation B, uh, if we agree recommendation A, that it doesn't have an effect on the European sites alone or in combination with other developments. Uh, the recommendation B is to approve and grant planning permission for the reasons set out in this report. Um, and that is subject to the completion and signing of a Section 106 agreement seeking to achieve uh, affordable housing, as I mentioned, a policy compliant level of 35%, a financial contribution towards education, nursery, primary and secondary education, um, a range of and a, a comprehensive package of highway mitigation measures. And this includes um, £100,000 towards uh, the junction improvements of Giffords Cross and Springhouse Road as a main route into Corringham but also a financial contribution towards a residential parking scheme, albeit that residential parking scheme would be subject to a separate highway legislation in to achieve that. That's outside of the remit of a planning application. But other contributions towards a car club, uh, £35,000 towards that, £40,000 towards a bus infrastructure improvements on Springhouse Road and Gordon Road, uh, and a travel plan, uh, which is subject to planning conditions, but there's also a travel plan monitoring requirements uh, through the 106 and I mentioned the ecology provision for the Essex Rams. Um, the, there are a number of planning conditions attached to the recommendation as well, 40 in total. Uh, they're all set out in the report. I won't go through those, but they're all set out in the report. Um, and the recommendation is one to approve, uh, subject to those recommendations. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. OK, uh, I've got a couple of questions and then uh, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over. So first and foremost, um, we're looking, uh, first of all, thank you to everyone who, who could, who could uh, make it to the, to the site visit. It was obviously a lovely day. It was good to, to get around, get inside the club and, and, and take a good look around uh, at what was going on. Um, so first and foremost, uh, these football pitches, you, there's a reference there that they're outside uh, of the, sort of the applicant's uh, uh, site, but they are managed by the applicant. I assume, or the owners? 
Yes, that's correct. The, uh, the slide before you shows the, uh, the two pitches um, helpfully indicating how they could be laid out on that site. Yeah. They all fall within the blue line area, so they are within the control of the applicant and owners. Yeah. Okay. Um, it was a bit concerning to find out that the pitches weren't in use. Um, I mean, obviously, we, we know football pitches are, are sought after. I, I always have trouble with the council and, and the, the fees that we charge. Um, is it a case of that the, the current applicants just said, look, we don't want football on there or, or no football? Do, do, do you know what the background is there? Because to me, cutting the grass, putting a bit of paint down, is pretty basic stuff. Uh, to me, it might, I wonder whether the applicant sort of just simply doesn't want football on there at the moment. Thank you. Uh, we, were in, we were informed that the pitches were last used about five years ago. Um, it's not been stated clearly as to why they're not being used at present or, or, or more recently than that, but they can be used if, if there is a need, um, and that, that is of something that is outside the remit of the planning application because it's in the blue line, um, but those pitches could still be used and, and reinstalled if, if needs be for the new season. Um, the land allows for that. And could you... Do you need the applicant's permission to get onto those pitches? You would need to come through the central part, of the, sorry, the, the front of the site to access those pitches. Um, they're all fenced around all the other boundaries, so you would, yes, you would need permission to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a reference on the site visit about, we was looking at landscape and was looking at the, the, the amount of parking uh, that was available. I think through conversations with yourself, there was a decision that actually um, what we needed is probably more green space and, and less parking, or obviously ideally we want both. Um, so it's a bit of a double-edged sword there. In order to provide more parking, you would have had to lose more green space. Is that is that a general consensus of, of what was going on there? Because clearly, I think you know, if, you, if you like the project, if you dislike the project, there's clearly a lack of parking on site at the moment, or certainly in my opinion. Um, I probably would have liked to see more. So what was the sort of the council's thinking behind that decision? Thank you. Uh, I inherited this application from a previous officer, but I understand from that previous officer that during the life of the planning application, uh, in terms of design and in terms of visual appearance, but also the benefit of providing amenity space for the future users of the, um, of the residential properties, was to get a bit of a more mixed and balanced um, layout here. So areas of parking that were my mouse works here, yeah, w were to extend further here as, as they were previously shown, um, and I think there's come some over here as well, did lead to, in, in design and in visual terms, quite a parking-dominant development. Um, obviously, with being apartments, anyone could go and live there, families could end up there, th there was obviously a need for amenity space, um, and that amenity space needs to meet um, the local plan um, requirements um, set out in, I think they're in the annex of the old local plan, but they're, they're still applicable, they're saved in, in policy terms and they're still applicable in terms of achieving um, an adequate and a usable amenity space, communal amenity space in this aspect. Uh, the, I should add the uh, apartments are shown to have balconies as well for, for a, a immediate sort of, more private sort of access, but uh, access to amenity, but these amenity areas are, are shown as well and uh, they were considered as, as, a, as a better alternative as well as the visual aspect to a less parking dominant site. And in terms of parking, um, there are, in terms of the residential aspect, there are 98 parking spaces provided and there's 95 dwellings. It does meet the council's uh, uh, draft parking standards in that respect in terms of parking uh, as a one for one for, for each, um, each residential property with, with, with free left over for additional spaces. So, three visitor spaces? Yes. So that's how many visitor spaces we've all got, three? That would be the situation, yes. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you, you've raised an interesting point there. You, you said, look, you know, you want more green space because families could be living there, etc. but you're going to have families and visitors that are going to need something to park their car. I think what's going to happen, I'll speak to Julian, but they're not going to be able to park their car on the site. So what's going to happen, they're going to have to park in the road. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit further further on. Um, what are these uh, these double stacked car parking? This is new in Farrick. Um, I understand these are underground parking facilities. You have a fob and your car just comes out of the ground. Is that correct? Uh, yes. I mean, we don't have a lot of details about those. I'm sorry, I haven't got anything to show you on a slide. But there's an area as, as part of the... Uh, uh, site that's at the top here that allows for um, double stack parking so 
uh, yes, someone could park their car in and then it would glow into the ground to allow someone to park on, on, on another level there. Um, I've seen them in other parts of the country, um, probably more in central London and places like that, but there are a way of uh, using up less land to provide some, some parking provision. Um, there's a planning condition recommended for full details of that to be provided, but again, that provides, in addition with all the uh, surface spaces, the, um, the level of parking that is um, identified in this application in terms of parking standards as well. Okay, so um, obviously they're, they're quite technical pieces of equipment. Who, who runs those? I assume it, is this going to be a site that's managed by a property maintenance firm and they obviously they maintain those? Because if they break, they're going to be fixing, aren't they? Obviously. Absolutely. Um, there will be a, as I say, there's a planning condition set out in the report that requires details of that and that will include the need for the management of them. I'll just check the condition now to make sure that covers that and if it doesn't we'll add some wording to, to that effect uh, if, we, if we do move forward. There is actually a car parking management scheme so it may be more under that which deals with the whole of the parking for the site rather than just those podium parking spaces but there is a requirement for the, in fact it is condition 18 does deal with actually the maintenance and management of those, po those, um, those uh, podium parking systems so there will be a requirement for the applicant to provide us with that information and who would be managing it, who would be maintenancing. So there is any problems in the future in terms of planning enforcement and things like that, if something's not working, we've obviously got that remit to go and uh, ensure that uh, that can be picked up and, uh, and addressed. Okay, thank you, because I think really what, what we've got here is, um, what I'm looking at is that the, the applicant has obviously clearly tried to, to get that green space in and we're really through desperation. They've got no choice but to, to put double stack car parking in to meet the the, the standard. So you, you said that it does meet the standard. So that's 95 properties, 98. I thought our standard was a bit higher than that. What, what is our standard? I thought it was one point something. The medium accessibility, which I think is what um, Julian might refer to if, if this is the applicable. Um, I think it is applic this is the one that's applicable. This is 1 to 1.25. But we have to have regard to this being very close to a town centre location. So. Uh, if anything, um, it, it's, it's more sustainable than anything in terms of parking and a one-for-one -one basis is considered acceptable in planning terms for this application. Based on this location you're going out on? Yes. Okay. Yeah, cool. And can I have one of these on my driveway? Do I have to apply for planning permission? Can I have a double stack per facility? Is that all right? You, we would need to see the details of it. If it's a, if it's a structure that's coming out the ground like these are, uh, and it's to the front of the, the dwelling, then it wouldn't be planning permission. Okay, thank you. All right, then. Well, look, I've taken up enough time. I've got a few more questions, but uh, uh, Councillor Byrne first and Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Poddy. Now, these football pitches, is there anything to stop the applicant coming back and saying they've not been used for five years, so could we stick another couple of blocks flats in there? Is that protected in any way? Or could they, this time next year, say the grass is now 10 foot high, so we might as well build on them and not play football? Um, thank you, uh, Chris. Yeah, just picking up on that point, because uh, my understanding is, um, yeah, I, I think over time they do expire. I think we had this question with Grey's Athletic um, a few months ago, because we've got some training pitches over near Farrock Hotel that are not being used. So, yeah, what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the deal there? Thank you. The situation would be um, if the sports pitches weren't used, uh, we've got no control over the use, that's down to the applicant, it's, it's private land, it's, it's down to them. But if someone wanted to come in with a, a different scheme and wanted to build on those, that would be subject to a planning application. Um, that would be subject to Sport England as well as the council's internal sports c consultation. Um, and I would suspect, and I can't obviously make that judgment until such an application would arise, but from experience of dealing with Sport England, if they were to lose those sports pitches, they would likely object and that may be reason in itself to, to refuse planning permission, but it depends on, if this, on how often the sports pitches are used as well would come into it, but I would suspect probably Sport England would have concerns and objections if, if they were to be developed on, uh, if, if that was to be the situation. But we don't have an application like that before us at the moment, um, and we're talking hypothetically about something that could happen in the future. It might not. Uh, Councillor Byrne, one more question. Cheers. Can we, could we not protect the football pitches, say yes to plan, we love it, but they are football pitches and not ever going to be flats? Can we put any protection on it? 
It's a bit of a difficult one because it falls outside the red line area. Um, it could potentially be part of a planning condition requiring a restriction on on that land, so they're only used for 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 sports pitches. Um, and I'm sure the applicant would be willing to uh, to, uh, to to agree to that. Um, but that's about as much as we can go with it. Yeah, I think. Look, ultimately, um, my opinion is is that from from what I picked up the other day that the club at the moment are just not interested in, in using those pitches. Now, that's not to say that they won't change in a later date. Obviously, that, that's their prerogative, but you wouldn't be in a scenario where they say, oh, well, the pitches ain't been used in five years. Well, they've not been used in five years because you've not let them out in five years. So it's probably protected in that sense. Um, uh, yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be overly concerned about that just yet. Um, uh, right, who was that? Was it Councillor Polly then? Piccolo? Oh, sorry, Councillor... Sorry, I wrote this down. Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Polly. Thanks, Chair. A uh, couple of questions, uh, Chris. Um, so who has access to those pitches? Are they accessible to the community? Are they limited to members of the sports club? What's the situation regarding access? If we're talking about getting these things used? The sports pitches fall within the applicant's lands, the private lands, so it would have to be need their permission to use. And I'm sure They'd be willing to, if someone, if football clubs in the community wanted to use those, I'm sure they'd be interested to help out to provide that uh, opportunity to use those sports pitches. But it is private land, so we haven't got control of it other than what, what Councillor Byrne said, we could put on a planning condition to require them to be used for that purpose. But obviously we can't make someone go and use those, um, and it's down to the applicant to, to allow for that. But I would think it would be in their interests uh, to provide that community provision uh, and probably generate some, some money out of it, I don't know, but certainly be able to use those sports pitches for those particular use rather than being made redundant or not used. Yeah, the, the bowls club now is leased out. You have to be members of the club, but it's leased purely to the bowling club and it's still called Springhouse Bowling Club. Same with the football. The football teams would lease it, but it'd still be Springhouse football. So you have to be a member. You couldn't just go in and play football. You've got to be a membership, but you could lease a pitch like that and call it Springhouse United. But it's purely membership. It wouldn't be open to anybody who can't have a kick about. Yeah, and I, I thought that, that was one of the surprising things because obviously um, I think they're pretty cheap to run and, and you can you can get some good prices out of them. So that was the only thing I was surprised about because you're going to get footfall as well on a Sunday afternoon, etc. But um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's something that would, uh, would be in the applicant's control. Uh, can you add another question? I did, thanks, Chair. The other question, so just, it's really point of clarification. So 95 properties, 98 parking spaces, council standard is 1.25. So are we basically saying that the surrounding community is expected to provide the rest of the 0.25? Uh, as I mentioned, we were, we've applied, the, the range is 1 to 1.25, and because of this location adjacent to the town centre, we've applied the, 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 uh, the space standards of um, one space per unit as, a, as an acceptable route forward. And, you know, in consultation with our highways authority, that's what they've advised is acceptable in highway terms. Um, so the one space per unit has been pro has, uh, is provided uh, in this application and that is what we've assessed and accepted. Okay, I'm, I'm not sort of trying to make it a trick question, but it does strike me that given that very few properties, however small, have just one car, that we are in effect saying that the parking we are expecting will spread out into the surrounding area. That's a reasonable assumption, isn't it? Uh, they, that could happen, but not everybody visits sites using cars, and uh, this is a, obviously a central site within Corringham. Uh, it can be accessed by a, a mo range of modes of transport, uh, as well as access to the town centre. There's, there's bus routes very close by, a number of bus routes. People can walk there from various parts of, of Corringham. As I say, it's central, so people can walk and cycle to this site if they need be. Um, and there's obviously... There, there, there is parking off-site, but that's obviously, um, you know, either in the highway or, or other car parking areas uh, in, you know, in the town centre and things like that. But, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's it. I'm not actually talking about visitors. I'm actually talking about the people buying these properties are likely to have, not, not all of them necessarily, but a good proportion of them, are likely to need to find places for two cars, not one. 
if people have two cars, then then some might have that. I think Julian was going to come in there, actually. I, I can actually say that at the moment, the census for flats, the average occupation ownership is 0.75 cars per flat. Yeah, I mean, p picking up on, on those points as we're on the subject, sorry, Councillor Polly, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you in. I mean, I, I know we've got problems at, uh, at Bellway. This was the, at the bottom of Devonshire Road. I know there's nightmares down there at the moment, and, and that was a, a, a quite a, well, it was it was a better standard. Um, I mean, people will will buy a, a flat if they've got, uh, you know, if you, I mean, you can be single and you can meet a partner, and then you know the partner moves in, and then and then it's game over, isn't it? You're not gonna you're not gonna move out. So I'll bring you in, Julian, because obviously I think this is this is I think it's the only thing that's that's causing concern at the moment. When when I um, approached the site the other day. One of the things I noticed with Corrigan was very, very little double yellow lines. It was close to the shops. Um, I'm surprised that the standard's been accepted on the basis of no train station because I think um, that that really would have, I think that would have helped a little bit because when, when we say there's plenty of modes of transport, well, what is it? There's a car and a bus if, you, if you're not going to have a train. Um, so what are we saying about the local road network? There's absolutely no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that if this development goes ahead, it's going to cause problems on that road. Okay. So, so what's in what's in place to stop it happening? To, to, so, to give you an idea of the accessibility, I live close to this development in Stamford, near the train station. It took me about twenty minutes to walk there from this site. So it's pretty, it's 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 walkable. It's only about five minutes on the bus to the train station, plus the fact the buses also go to Basildon to Basildon as well, which is a quicker route in. And I know a lot of people from. I used to travel up into London myself, so I know a lot of people from Corringham who uses the buses. So in terms of public transport, it's, it's got a lot of it's got a lot of accessibility. Uh, you also note that uh, our, our transport manager has also requested that that, that money is given towards a car club, so that obviously that the, the, there could be a number of the spaces potentially put towards a car club, so that that that, that, that people could use car club instead of that. But in terms of on street, we've, the, the applicant has indicated to us that they, they will contribute towards mitigation measures towards uh, potentially some sort of residence type parking scheme around to prevent parking of overspill parking from the development on the local, on the local roads. So that, uh, the, 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 but that obviously, as Chris has indicated, that will be subject to consult further consultation. It's not within the planning remit, but that, that, that they put forward monies to bring in a potential residence parking scheme as part of the development. Yeah, and uh, I mean, that, that, again, picking up on that, because it, it is making me nervous, because, I mean, at the moment, you can you can park on that road. Uh, it, it looks like there was a lot of spaces. You can walk into to the local shops. Um, I mean, ultimately, also, I imagine if the venue's busy, I mean, you've got 70 spaces. I imagine if the venue gets busy, then actually the overflow will be used uh, on a, on a, on a, on a right. If, you know, if there's a wedding there, if there's a, a couple of football matches. At the moment, if the spring house is full, I assume they are allowed to use the, the local road network. What we're going to say here is, is, well, in order to allow this development, there's an acknowledgement that we're going to have to uh, bring in the WL lines, bring in the CPZs um, uh, to manage it. I, th I think what we're saying is is that the development in terms of parking spaces, it, 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 in terms of the one for one, that is within our parking standards. So, it, it is in, it is in the medium accessibility area, which is one to one point two five. What what we raise concern is a bit like yourselves that that potentially yes, somebody could own two cars, or uh, you know they've done done an assessment, for instance, of the Springhouse car park itself. Now, yes, it does get full, but it's it's not full all the time uh, on a busy event. But we can't. But when it, but when it is yeah, full, you you can't you can't actually provide a a parking standard for a worst case scenario. We have to provide it for the average scenario, if you like. So yeah, we. Can, I, we but I'm, I'm a local councillor. I have to provide it to a, for the worst case scenario because I've got to explain it to the residents. Yeah. So then it all kicks I, off. I I under I understand that, but par parking parking standards can't be such that, that, that we ask for the whole area to be... If, if for instance, and I know that, that, that in the past that they've had concerts here, for instance, at, 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 here, at here, but we couldn't, we couldn't ask that they provide all that parking potentially for uh, a concert with the number of people that might turn up. There are, there, there are obviously public parking facilities around that people could use, and normally those concerts would be held at night 
and at those sort of times the park the parking within those car parks is is a lot less so and they're not they're not too disjointed from 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 the site either they're you know a couple of minutes walk a lot of the car parks from the site if there was an event on it at the evening uh, it, it would be it would be inappropriate for us to insist on having a car parking standard that would cover that that a, a such a huge potential of, of a we ha we have to look at it in the round and in general we, we they've done a, a parking study of the, the capacity of the car park and in, in terms of how many vehicles are in there and in the main that the, the, the car park is not full to capacity yeah yeah it's just um going through the report this is this has got all the hallmarks that make me nervous control parking zones cameras double stack car parking it's just i mean once the development's built we, we've got to really be sure that this is not going to cause chaos in a local road network and, and it is and I, and I just feel that for me i would have liked to have seen more parking on site but let's let's see where we end up because um, i'm not i'm not going to push it too much if, if if there's no appetite for it um councillor polly sorry you've been waiting for a while thank you very much chair um on page 62 um we've got traffic in Pact 6.29, the applicant's transport assessment identifies that there would be 55 two-way vehicle movements. Um, I'd, I'd just like some clarification if I could. Is that, are we referring to the whole site? Uh, is that just the residential anticipate? Because it does say weekdays a.m. and p.m. Um, so, if, if it was alluding to the social facilities, um, there's no weekend consideration where the majority of the, the um, I, I would think the the usage would be. Um, we we've also identified that um, with the double stack, the, um, the that's a very expensive. And it's a condition, isn't it? A condition they can come back and remove it. I'm just a bit nervous that that might might sound good in the application, but it could cost of that could be prohibitive, and they might come back and review that. Um, there's also a reference at 6.30 of uh, parking enforcement's AMPR. Who's going to administer that? Uh, with you, I share a nervousness. Is that a private parking uh, company, uh, we, which we've had many problems with in the past? Um, so uh, I've got some information on that 6.29. I do have a couple of other questions, Chair. I don't know if you want me to give them all together or let the officers come back on that. Uh, well, it was quite, quite detailed. Um, did, did anyone want to come back on that? I'll, I'll come back on the traffic movements. The traffic movements are the... Are the are the daily traffic movement or the the, the, hour, the, the peak hour and and that will, is what we would normally have an assessment on because in general they, they the two the morning and evening weekday peak periods are the worst traffic periods in general in the exception maybe for instance lakeside whereas obviously uh, probably saturday round about 10 or 11 would be pretty pretty busy as well because of the nature of the the beast if you like so in, in a lakeside area uh, you'll see in the in the following development, we would ask for a, a, a capacity at assessment on a, on a on a Saturday, for instance. But in this instance, as the traffic flows are generally lower on a Saturday during the peak times, we wouldn't ask for that. So, so you're saying that's for the whole site? That's for yeah. the the, the, yeah. the 168 parking spaces in total would generate yeah. 55 traffic. Yeah, you got to, you got to, you got to understand. In terms of traffic generations, in the morning, in a development between eight and nine, a number of a number of people will go out in the morning. The, the club is probably not going to have a significant number of vehicles going in there in the morning. You may have, I don't know, several people going to the gym, but the majority that the, the traffic movements in the morning will probably be out of the development. But all 95 people within won't be all going out. In, in in the morning in the it, at that between eight and nine in the morning people vary their their times we we use uh, uh, it that the, there's modeling being done where sites have been looked at housing sites business sites whatever and they they've done traffic counts and they've done counts in 
in, in evening and peak period to see what those traffic generations are. And using those traffic generations, those are the, the, the traffic generations that are likely to be from this site. So that's from data that's been collected previously on other sites. I think Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Watson and myself all living in the west of the borough are fully aware that there's no such thing as peak times because it's 24-7 traffic with the M25, with the bridge, with the A30. We, we're living in different times now, I, I, I think. Uh, but So uh, that's my question answered. I wondered if it was akin to the duration to the, the residential development aspect of it or whether it was the whole no, site. No, so it's, it's, the whole it's, site. it's the whole site. Okay. So in there it does say about the, the planning conditions, about uh, making sure people don't use... Uh, each other's parking spaces and uh, and the like. That that brings me on to what we were discussing earlier about the put football pitches should at a future date they come back into service. I mean that Sunday morning, as we were talking about Sunday markets earlier, Sunday morning football, especially the sort of the 13 to 12 year old 13 leagues uh, generate a, a great deal of traffic um, for the, the car share schemes don't seem to work with those type of organizations each each child is brought in by their own parents I, I don't disagree with you but but if you look at Sunday traffic compared to 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 other times of traffic historically peak time traffic during the weekday has always been the worst because except in the current conditions, m most people would be going to work probably, uh, you know, by car uh, to, to wherever. So that those times have traditionally, that the period may be extended, I, I don't disagree, I don't disagree with you. I mean, now you could say, particularly in, in this area, because I think people are aware of, you know, where potential traffic generation is, for instance. For instance, when I worked over in Kent, I used to live at se seven o'clock in the morning because I knew that if I got to the bridge at 8 o'clock in the morning, it, it would be pretty difficult to get across. So I don't disagree with you, but traditionally, the, the 8 till 9 and the, the, five, the 5 to 6 are still the peak periods or maybe quarter of an hour each side. So in general, a lot of the time, we'll actually ask the applicant to assess what they'll look at the existing traffic counts and we'll ask them to pick out that peak, peak period. Now, that, as I said, that... Peak period may flex between eight and nine. It could be quarter, quarter to quarter to eight to, to to quarter to nine, for instance. But generally, it's around about eight o'clock is when the worst you see the worst of the traffic because you've got school traffic and people going to work. Okay, okay. I think I had cancelled. Oh, oh, sorry, I haven't finished my question. No, sorry. sorry. Uh, page 67, the loss of light, it, that was one of the objections from Dovecot. It says that there would not be a significant loss of light. So what, what, what are we considering to be a significant loss of light? Uh, and also, page 79, I'll just say this, Chair, the, the electric gate, where is that positioned? Will that stop like traffic having to stop on the road to, to, for it, the gate to open? And also, what is emergency vehicle access for uh, these gated communities uh, can cause significant problems for entrance for emergency vehicles as well. Thank you. Well, I'll answer that the, the gate ones, we would ex expect the gates to actually be set back from the highway so that a ve vehicle could get, get off. We wouldn't expect it to be right up against the highway so that it would, vehicles would be waiting. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure it's in outline at the moment, so I assume it's in conditions for that to, to be resolved. I think Chris might be able to sort your light issue out. Yeah, sorry, just picking up on that. So um, this is the gate to get into the residential community? Yes, yeah, so at the moment we don't have any details of, of what that would look like. Uh, condition 15 requires application for approval of reserve matters to include the details of the proposed electric gate. Um, it is indicated on the plans, um, and it's obviously something that's being looked at to be provided for probably security reasons for, the, for those people, that, uh, the res future residents of those apartments. Uh, as I say, we don't have any details at the moment, but they'll be, they'll be provided with the, um, uh, with the reserve matters application. 
In terms of um, the other point on uh, on dovecots, um, when we say about significant loss of light or overbearing, uh, obviously we're making a judgment on, and I think the slide in front of you, in fact, the next one might be a bit more useful. Yeah, so I know, appreciate it's difficult to see, but dovecot is a, is a building up here. Um, and when we talk about significant light, if this building, which is the closest one, was to be located right up to the boundary, then clearly that would have a, a big impact on those, on those properties and their garden, which does back onto this site. But we're saying it's not a significant impact because it's set away from the boundary, and that's quite some distance. I think we're talking about eight to ten metres there. Um, and, uh, and that element is, I think, two to three storeys high as well. But it doesn't cover the whole of the... You've got to remember, it goes all the way along here, so it's only a part of that. Their, their light um, would not be affected from, by this development in terms of um, a material impact that would warrant refusal. It's, it's, it's sufficient in terms of um, daylight and sunlight. There's a study accompanying the planning application to prove that as well. Uh, that has been looked at in terms of uh, creating the assessment to the report and therefore there isn't any material impact on those residential prop properties there or their residents. Uh, that would be unacceptable. It's, it's an acceptable impact uh, in terms of this um, layout and arrangement. Okay, thank you. Um, just out of interest, I mean, if you're going to install a, um, a security gate, that's going to need to be quite deep into that site. I would imagine just adjacent to those first two buildings, because um, that can be a bit of a, a hassle that if you're a visitor, of course, because you're not going to have uh, access, you're not going to have like a fob. Um, Certainly not for free spaces. You're not going to hand out 100, 100 fobs for free spaces. Um, and I've, I've experienced this before. That it's, you know, you can be sitting there for a couple of minutes before whoever you're trying to access actually, you know, presses the buzzer from inside the house. So it could probably overcome, but it'd have to be quite f far into the site. Right. Um, I had Councillor Pickle and Councillor Watson. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Just a couple of points. Um, the people, well, it's been referred to the uh, the football pitches that are being supplied. As far as I'm concerned, they're outside the red line area um, and should take, play no part at all in the decision making for this post thing because at any time they can decide to do something else on that. If they are serious about including them, those football pitches as a facility for within the club, they should be included in the red line area because other than that, it's not a planning consideration because they've got to do what they like with it later on, as far as I can, under my understanding is. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting point, but obviously it's the Springhouse Leisure Facility. The whole point, the, the reason we're allowing houses, the promotion is we're, we're upgrading the facilities I, I, with I the changing I rooms. Don't, I don't disagree with that, but I'm saying that that being outside the red line area, if the housing is successful, there's nothing to stop them coming back and saying, actually, we'll put an application in for, for some houses on that bit, because it wasn't within the planning permission that was granted to what's there at present. So if they were serious about it being a facility for the application that's in front of us now, and it must be because otherwise they wouldn't have mentioned it, that red line boundary should include those football pitches. That's, we're debating a bit now, but I, I say I was really just to bring. The, the other thing, uh, it's been mentioned about the car club. I think you said there was five or seven vehicles. Where, do we know where these vehicles will be parked or were those five or seven vehicles come out of the allocated parking spaces that are already put down for the the club and the uh, and, and the housing. Where are these where are these vehicles going to park? Uh, are we assured that they're not going to take up the allocated parking spaces that we've been told are available to residents and the club users? As far as I'm aware, that that the the, the, the whys and wherefores of how the car club will work hasn't been decided yet. In a lot, a lot of developments now, the, the, the transport manager will, will ask for the, the potential to provide car club. Those, those may potentially be even on street, so they could potentially be for general use, not just specifically for the, the, the development. So if you, if you look at places like Westminster, Westminster have car clubs that are based on the street, and in a lot of instances, they're then open for anybody to potentially use. So in terms of how that will operate, I can't really say at this moment. Yeah, sorry, I, I must admit, I, I didn't write down where that was. But they do actually mention that there is a car, they will be supplying a car club within this plan application. It's mentioned within the plan application. My concern is, if they're saying that they're, 
one of the benefits of saying this application could go ahead and there's not some not as much need for residential parking for those that live there is that they're going to have a car club there that's fine but are those are those cars that the car club operate going to take up some of the parking spaces that they're saying are meant to be there for the sports club and the residents that's all i'm trying to clarify that i don't know i'm not sure we're in the report i am aware that the that the transport managers asked for a contribution towards a car club. Chairman, I can just advise it is a contribution towards the car club. It came up through the uh, uh, transport manager's uh, consultation response. It's something the applicant's willing to do. They'll be willing to work with the, um, uh, the officers to achieve that car club, um, providing that uh, in terms of how it would work. We don't, as I say, as Julian has mentioned as well, we don't have all the details at present, but it's a route forward in terms of um, uh, a planning obligation and that money comes in to achieve that and the, how it will operate is something we still have the control and the ability to do through that planning obligation. Now, as you say, in a lot of instances now, because, because the, the, trans, the transport team just feel that um, if, if, it, if it was a car club run specifically by the applicant, it could be the case that obviously if, if it doesn't get much usage or potentially usage by the, the, the residents within the development, that it could sort of disappear, if you like. So they're, they're now looking for contributions to ensure that the car clubs remain in operation, so that it would be operated by the council, not by, not by, the, not by the applicant. So that's why I said it, it may not just be within the development, it may be a general car club for use by people in Corringham as a whole. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Chair. Can I just ask a quick question uh, around the um, car park spaces? We've got 98. We could potentially have a car club. Maybe. Maybe use them. That's 93. What ratio of those 98 are for disability? Off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but they, they, they should be. It should have the minimum uh, that's the required within the parking standards. And I'm assuming that minimum will also go along the same as affordable or the housing that's there for, dis for people with disabilities? Yeah, I, th I think well, when we went to site visit, it was definitely a specific point. Um, I'm, I'm sure the speaker statements or, or, or Chris, we can, get to, we can get an answer for you. It has been taken into consideration, but the number, you are right, but I'm sure we can get that to you before before you have to make a decision because i'm just thinking that these car park spaces we're always talking about 98 if you take five away and then we have the ratio of the disability ones and that's even less for the people that's in the buildings and what is the procedure if nobody's using those disability car parks how do you how do you then do you flip them or do you just let them be so the current standards are not a standard that they provide say 95 spaces and then the additional uh is you additionally supply provide for disabled users that disabled use is within that nine, 95 spaces okay. so if it's 95 spaces a number of those allocation will be disabled spaces because we we, we need to we, that it, there could be disabled people using who okay. want to purchase the flat so they need to be able to park so in order to get up the quota of the standard 1.25 that's additional 23 spaces no, the, 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 the allocation would is be one. required if we wanted to go to 1.25 yeah. that's an additional 23 spaces yeah is that development cope with the 23 spaces if you do it nicely like on how you work you might have to take a bit more off of the green space or something like that but can it come up to that standard the development that the council's requirement is at 1.25 that, that's that's a maximum standard it's it's not it's not that the standard that, that, that you have to, to, to keep to. So we have a, a maximum and a minimum standard. Uh, this development in terms of the, the, the residential side of it, in terms of the 95 spaces meets that minimum standard. Okay. But that, that, that would be up to yourselves regarding whether you consider the parking was appropriate or not. But in this case, it meets our minimum standard. So in terms of the residential numbers, so is in that terms is acceptable. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, being on uh, being on planning for some time, this is an issue we get quite a lot. I think the issue is the standard's so poor. 
um, we're, we're, we're sometimes cornered. I mean, you are exactly right. I think if you could fit more spaces on that site, all of a sudden, I think it it becomes viable, in my opinion. But the stand, it's, uh, it's a tough one. And because it's close to the town centre, there's a suggestion that it doesn't have to be as high as 1.25. I'd argue that 1.25 is poor, and, that, and that's considered the, uh, the upper end of the scale. Um, so, yeah, it's just all... all you, you're going to get this a lot over the next 12 months. Yeah. <laughs> There. So now what we'll do, oh, uh, Councillor Ackenby. Thank you, Chair. I just want to ask a quick question on page um, 71, recommendation B. Um, my question is, will all the contributions mentioned in page 71 be enough to mitigate the impact of the development in the area? The um, contributions would be secured through section 106 requirement so I think cuts the last part of your question question is um, the contributions mentioned in page 71 if uh, is going to be enough to mitigate um, the development they have been uh, the impact of the development sorry no, you're, you're right they are it, yes they in, in short yes they are and they come through the consultation process so consultees have identified that uh, you know, all those that are listed are, are required to mitigate the impacts of development for the development to be considered acceptable. Okay then, fantastic. All right then. So uh, what we'll do now is we'll move on to the next phase, which is uh, the speaker statements. Um, Wendy, uh, let's have a look. We've got. Um, I'm going to go to uh, the democratic service readout first. Yeah, Wendy, that's the local resident. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and that's uh, Janet at uh, Lipmoden. That you're, you're happy to read out, yeah? And this is a resident statement uh, of objection. Yes, uh, this is a statement of objection from Janet Lipmoden. I have recently been sent a letter from the planning department asking me to present objections from the collective residents of Roslyn House as I am key coordinator of the directors. We would like to oppose the application because we consider the amount of dwellings would incur too many people and vehicles to the pro proposed site. If they restrict the building to two floors, which would tie in with Dove Court alongside, this would reduce both. The present application would allow far more traffic onto an already overcrowded road. There are often hold-ups and jams along this section of the road. We have read the highways reports and can only assume they don't live in this area when they consider this. There will be a lot more traffic with cars going in and out of the new site, including deliveries, lorries, police and all the visitors and members of the sports club and doctor surgery. If the parking facilities are not adequate, and we don't believe they are, the cars will spill over to the surrounding area, which includes the Corringham Town Centre shopping precinct. Should they block up the car park's parking, should they block up the car park's parking, will become a pre parking will become a premium and therefore make shopping in Corringham less attractive. People will go elsewhere and the centre will deteriorate as Stanford has. We are residents of a retirement block of flats. The disruption and mess during construction will greatly inconvenience the whole area. And should the site be built to current plans, the unrestricted view to our first and second floors would be compromised, a facility the occupants paid extra for. The number of dwellings should be substantially reduced to facilitate this project. Please keep any project in line with the existing neighbourhood, not overrun with extra people and traffic. OK, thank you, Wendy. Thank you for reading that out. And that takes us to our... Uh, next statement of objection, and that's uh, Councillor uh, Shane Ralph, who's a ward councillor. Uh, Shane, you've got three minutes in which to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, planning of the, uh, sorry, the planners attended the Coronham Community Forum to present their plans on the evening. The residents raised their concerns over the parking or the lack of parking on the property. This has led to even more concerns that from the development for, that they will park in the Springhouse Road. So the residents are concerned that if they, with the lack of parking, the one point, uh, was it one to one flats, is going to overspill onto the parking and park in the Iceland car park behind it. Um, this isn't owned by Iceland, but it's a property or a lane behind the parking where residents could park if they were spilling out of this development. Residents that live right in front of the development I fear that own parking spaces will be taken up in Springhouse Road by residents for the new development due to the lack of parking now. I'm already dealing with a lot of parking problems in Springhouse Road, and this is only going to add to it. They don't feel that the parking zone that has been 
mentioned to the residents, I don't know when some have mentioned to the residents, um, is going to solve the problem with parking permits being implemented that could cost extra. The town has lack of parking for shoppers, any reduction from parking in the towns has a massive impact, impact <coughs> not only on the residents, but also on local traders. The access to the site raised great concerns with local shoppers and residents. On many different days, traffic builds up at the turning into the town centre and into the Iceland's car park. It is already common to sit in traffic outside the Pring House Club waiting to turn in. Um, on the site visit yesterday, it was very, very, um, it was a quiet day and there wasn't much going on. On Saturday and mainly on a lot of the other days, the traffic piles up down there, especially during the school times. I'm really shocked, 55 movements a day. That, that's, that seems really low to me. 55 movements a day. 98 flats. That, that just doesn't seem right. There's got to be more than that. Uh, the, the residents of Corinham, they, they are... They struggle for parking anyway. You know, when they come to me and they ask me to speak on their behalf, they're really passionate. Number 35, obviously, at Springhouse, he called me over yesterday once we finished our, our talk. And he said to me, can you highlight the danger that they feel this could cause for the turnings and the amount of traffic going in and out of that site with the lack of parking in the area. So the residents in the area at the moment would like this to be rejected based on the parking alone. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Rell. And that takes us to our last uh, speaker of uh, this evening. That's a statement in support, which is uh, Russell Barnes, agent. I understand you're here this evening, Russell. Uh, please take your seat and uh, you've got uh, three minutes to uh, present your case. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, good evening, Chairman, members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity for our comments to be presented with reference to this application. As you are aware, the planning officer has put this application forward to committee with a recommendation for approval. So rather than labour the points that have already been addressed by the officer, we thought it would be more useful for councillors if we simply highlighted some key points about the proposal. The application before you seeks to replace the existing sports and social club with a new and improved facility. The new club will provide superior opportunities for its members and the wider community as a whole. Councillors should note that this is a family business with multiple generations having worked and owned the property for well over 50 years, as well as helping construct the original bar in the 1950s. Membership has been steady, ranging between 2,000 and 2,300 year on year, with many people stating that they don't know what they would do without the club as a means of meeting others and finding joint interests. The established business and its owners are committed to safeguarding this community asset, whilst investing to increase jobs and local opportunities for the wider community and future generations. The proposal seeks to enable the development of the club through the construction of housing in line with the council's identified local needs. In addition, the proposal will meet the requirements set out in the affordable housing delivery as well. The site is not within the green belt, nor is it a greenfield development. It is already previously developed land of limited architectural merit and absence of landscaping, ecology and biodiversity opportunities. The new club, however, will achieve an outstanding rating under BRIAM and 20% of its energy generation will be achieved on site. The location is within a sustainable area and benefits from access to a range of services and facilities. In addition, it has been agreed that the scheme satisfies the test of sustainable development, as outlined in the MPPF, by meeting the economic, social and environmental objectives, and therefore is compliant to both local and national policy. As a result, the application before you in its current form has no outstanding objections from any of the main consultees, most notably Anglian Water, Environmental Health, Essex Police, Flood Risk Advisors, Highways, Housing Team and Sports England. Working with the officer, the applicant has been mindful to address as many of the neighbour concerns as possible within the application life cycle, and it is worth councillors noting that at the end of the extended consultation stage, there were twice as many local comments in support of the application over those against, which is representative of the improvements this application will bring. Social hubs are becoming fewer and far between, having already lost the Pegasus Club, the Cat Cracker and the Pompadour in Corringham over the last five years, with others set to struggle further. It's extremely important that clubs like the Spring House continue to be part of the local community and receive the much needed support from council and its members to safeguard the future of the business. We hope the councillors will agree with the recommendation of officers and give their support to an application that will benefit the town, local residents and members of the club. On behalf of our client, we'd like to thank you for your time. Fantastic, thank you very much. Okay, uh, is there any further questions before we head into debate? No, okay, all right then. So that's all the, uh, that's all the statements there. Okay then, uh, let's head into the debate. So, um, 
I'll start and then I'll go on to Councillor Byrne um, and then if anyone else wants to speak, please raise your hands. So in general, I'm not, I'm not against the, the, the principle of this development. I think um, I'm sympathetic towards the developer and the work that they've done. Obviously, they've listened to, to, to what the councils uh, have told them. Um, there's absolutely no doubt that it's going to be a community benefit and, and improved facilities. For me, there, there is that one outstanding issue of parking. I think there's absolutely no doubt that uh, to introduce this scheme, it's going to cause problems on that local uh, road network. Um, I'm very nervous when I see things such as CBZs, car share, double stacking. I mean, look, it's, it's got all the hallmarks of, of not having enough spaces. Now, I, I sympathise with the developer in the sense that they've tried to provide a, 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 a fair amount of green space, but ultimately, it would, be, it would appear to be too much there. Um, is there, is there something workable for the future if it was to come back? I mean, I'm not sure how it's going to go this evening. It may be you, you, you vote it forward. Um, I don't think I'm there yet unless you can convince me otherwise. Could you eat into a little bit more of that green space to provide ample parking to secure the future of the club? Potentially, that's going to upset uh, uh, Sports England. But ultimately, I think you could probably fit a full-size pitch there, maybe a five-a-side pitch. I mean, I wouldn't have no trouble with, with extra green space going. But ultimately, this is going to act, uh, impact uh, the residents on Springhouse Road. At the moment, it's it's easy to park. You've got access to the shops there. And to, to introduce controlled parking zones, which will be an, an inevitability, um, it's, 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 it's almost with an element of regret that I can't support it. But I'm interested to see what you think. I think there is material considerations from previous similar decisions. We recently rejected the Ford site for a complete lack of parking. Um, and, and, and access, there's absolutely no doubt it's going to have an impact. So, interested to see what you think. Um, uh, who's next? Councillor Byrne and Councillor Fletcher. Well, I, I went out on Saturday to kind of pick holes in this plan and say, I was there 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and midday with Terry and Steve, and we didn't see any issues with traffic. No problem. This is your busy day. In fact, going during the week, there's more problems caused because TVC have opened a young offenders place there and they haven't provided any parking for visitors or their staff so the actual parking issues on Springhouse Road are created by TVC and not the club all their staff all their work could take the whole road up so the, the parking issue is a TV issue, TVC issue and not the club as you said I would like to see more parking spaces green's nice but I'd rather see cars inside than outside the other thing is the funding if this was the, the agent said this an application community focused why is there no funding to friends of Corringham Park all the ward councillors would surely bite their hands off and look at this build more favourably and that would benefit Corringham twofold the funding at the moment seems to me as a crowd pleaser helping out on the road that's part of council's job surely giving them money so I would say look at the community can you divert that money to the real cause and show you are community focused that any money this is another sum of money has to go to the Friends of Collingham Park if we are interested in the community. For me, the plan is well thought out, ticks most of the boxes. I look for negatives and have really come out with only positives. Uh, Councillor Fletcher, then Piccolo. Thank you, Chair. Wouldn't it be refreshing if we got an applicant who came to us and said, We've got a great idea here? I think it's going to be really good. We've put in as much parking as we can, but if we're honest, we think it's probably going to outflow onto the streets around. Instead, we get, oh, it meets the, uh, it, it meets the, the, the standard. Well, I'm afraid a half-blind ferret can take a look at that and realise there's not enough parking. So let's forget about standards. Practical common sense tells you there isn't enough parking in there. Agree with Councillor Byrne that as things stand, Springhouse Road may not be that packed. Once this goes in with this parking provision, I think that situation will change. Secondly, I'm interested to see that the, uh, the applicant's uh, statement in favour very much focuses on the sports club. I would guess that most people would be more than happy to have a sports club. It's everything else that goes around it that's going to cause the parking problem. I don't think anybody has got an issue overall with the idea of this development. It sounds like a lot of people would be very happy to see the sports club uh, brought back to life. But until that parking issue is resolved, 
it is going to become a talking point and a negative talking point when that is built. Okay, thank you. Um, who else had their hand? Right, Councillor Figola. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of things. I mean, I'm, I come back into the car car point and now saying it doesn't necessarily need to be on site. It could be anywhere. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't... It, it needs to be either on site or right next to the site because otherwise the residents aren't going to use it and they're not going to walk miles away. <laughs> Talking about, they, they brought up about the good transport links. Yeah, there's great transport links in Thurrock if you want to go um, east to west. But if you want to go to Jumpsford or any, if, if you don't want to go use the Fenchurch Street line, then as far as work and anything else are concerned, it's, it's rubbish. So people rely on their cars. And not only that, people don't really use... Even if you went to, to work all week using the transport, what about when you go and visit friends and family or when friends and family come to visit you? You don't know that the people that are going to visit you live on good transport links. They may not be able to get on the, on the, on the facilities that come outside your well, reasonably close to your house. So the, the lack of parking is a major concern for me. Um, because I can see it causing problems to the sound centre, um, and um, we, you know, we quite often say, "What have I got written down there?" Um, they're relying on local transport for the reason for not supplying the parking, and but they're supplying more green space on site. There's a really big park right next door to it. Now, if we, if they can use parking as a reason for uh, uh, or the town centre parking and the lack of parking, if they can use that for them to go through, then surely we could argue that do we need as much green space as that on site? Because you've got a massive park literally next door to the site. Um, so if they can walk to the town centre to get a bus, they can walk to the park next door to get their green space. So yeah, my, I say my concern is I don't think there's enough parking on site and I think it needs to be sorted out. Oh. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, uh, can we extend uh, standing orders till the close of play? Is that agreed? Absolutely. Excellent, fantastic, okay. Uh, was there any further comments before we, we head to the vote? Oh, Councillor Polly. Sorry, Chair, if I've missed it, I do apologise. Could we have the answer to Councillor Watson's question about the what is the ratio of disabled parking of those 95 spaces? How many of those will be designated disabled? You did. I think you did yeah. say the officers would provide that. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chris, have you, uh, have you got any closer to that? How, how many disabled spaces have we got on there? The layout plan in front of you, um, I appreciate it's probably not the easiest to see, um, shows some kind of yellow borders around parking spaces, um, parking spaces in the sports club car park, but also in the residential, which are identified for disabled parking. Um, but I re would reiterate there is a car parking management plan so if all those spaces aren't uh, required for disabled purposes, then some of them could be used for, uh, for other means. But the facilities there, it would all be there to allow for the disabled as well as other parking on that site. Um, on the residential, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I count. And then on the leisure, I've got three. Oh, four actually, because there's one right by the entrance. So, so it's 168 spoils those entrances, is that it? Yeah, that's what I've got. Thanks. Yeah. All right then. Okay, so um, let's let's head to the vote and, and see where we end up. So there is a recommendation um, set out on page um, 71. And that's recommendation um, 8.1. So this is um, well, it's a little bit bureaucratic, this vote, but uh, obviously what, what we're saying is is that uh, the, the local planning authority formally determined the pursuit of regulation 61. This is to say that effectively that the land itself is okay to be built on, and I'm, that's something I agree with. Um, so um, I, I'm happy to propose that. Um, is that a seconded? Councillor Byrne, okay. So, um, all those in favour of recommendation A, uh, 8.1, please raise your hands. Okay, thank you, Councillor Piccolo. Um, uh, all, those, uh, all those against? Okay. Okay, Wendy, so that's... Um, 
did I need a proposal there? Sorry, John. I proposed it. There, it was there a second there, sorry. Councillor Burns, sorry. We'll get that, sorry. All right then, so then that takes us on to the, uh, uh, the main vote as to whether we are happy to approve this development. Uh, I'm looking for uh, somebody to recommend 8.2. Councillor Byrne. Okay, is that seconded? Councillor Lydiard. Okay. Um, all those in favour of uh, recommendation uh, 8.2 uh, to approve the development, please like, raise your hands. Wendy, are you happy with that three, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Cool. And uh, all those against? Okay, so that was uh, three votes in favour of the uh, 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 recommendation and um, five against. Uh, John, can I bring you in there, please? Yeah, okay, so we need somebody to put forward a, an alternative recommendation for consideration. Um, and then, so in terms of the constitution 7.2, so if the planning committee seeks to make a decision contrary to the planning officer's recommendation, the following will apply. The move of the motion should clearly specify or write down the motion, including the reasons for departing from the officer's recommendation. Both the reasons of the motion should be put to the committee orally and in the public, um, even if the reasons are tentative. Any motion must be seconded. Then the second part, the planning officer should always be given the opportunity to explain the implications of what has been proposed to the planning committee in public before the vote is taken. And then if the planning committee's arguments against the planning officer's recommendation are very clear and substantiated and no longer tentative on planning grounds, the application shall be determined at the meeting. If not, the application should be deferred to enable the planning officer to draft a further report for a subsequent meeting of the committee outlining the implications of making a decision contrary to the planning officer's recommendation. Then, if appropriate, the legal advisor's opinion should be sought as to whether a deferral is necessary. So, in terms of procedure, we do need to have a reason specified for the refusal, which then Chris will be able to discuss. Okay, thank you for that, John. Okay, so um, on that basis, I'd like to uh, recommend a refusal, and uh, I have two main consi uh, uh, material considerations. Councillor Fletcher, was that a second? Uh, sorry, no, um, I was going to put a, an alternative recommendation, but uh, I'll shut up for the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, my alternative recommendation would be to refuse on uh, two material considerations. Uh, that would be uh, one, parking, and two, uh, similar decisions, uh, previous similar decisions. Uh, in relation to parking, um, given the local road network, there is uh, an obvious concern that if this development uh, was to go ahead, that it would have an inverse uh, ad, uh, impact on the local road network. Whilst we acknowledge there will always be some impact, the lack of parking on site I consider to be severe. Which would ultimately lead into the introduction of a, a CPZ in a local economic area that does not have CPZs for the shops. And in reference to previous similar decisions, uh, very recently in the last few months, we rejected the application on the old Ford site in Ockenden. And one of the reasons for, for refusal was the lack of parking. Chris, do you want to address those points? Yeah, John, I was, I was just going to say whether the committee wanted to consider a deferral instead of a refusal. I know you've, you've mentioned the word refusal, whether there'd be an opportunity to potentially amend the application to potentially increase the parking on the site, whether that would address members um, concerns, um, unless you wanted to move to re refusal. I need to think about that because then you're going to start eating into the greenery. I mean, 
I mean, are there options to look for parking a little bit more further into the field, which is outside the, the applicant? I mean, I know it would mean communicating with uh, Sports England. I mean, I don't even know if that's something that you guys want. What I'm trying to say is at the moment, you've got, you've got the, the pitch there, a full-size pitch, and an under-13 pitch that's not being used. Could you have a full-size pitch, a five-a-side pitch, which is considerably smaller, than, but you'd still have five-a-side football on there, and then could you eat into that keep the greenery on site and then supply more parking. What would your problem be with that, Gorn? Yeah, the, those pitches aren't within the application yeah, site. Oh, sorry, I, I thought you were saying because because they, they were there uh, at the moment, unless they're brought within the planning application, they don't play any part on it. And, and to be honest with you, um, I, I wouldn't mind if they're going to increase the parking, then move some of it into that into that area, because I I don't, I don't believe there's any real intention. If there was a real intention with them pitches, they would have been included in this application and not outside the red line. That's just my view. I think just sorry, just coming. I think Chris identified earlier that Sport England, well, Sport England are obviously consultee on the the current application. I think Sport England would have a concern if we were to lose pitch provision for parking spaces so that would, wouldn't be something we'd be able to sort of justify with Sport England so that would be a concern if you were looking at solving the problem by by moving backwards within the site um, looking at the site plan there is potentially more space between the apartment blocks where you could potentially fit more more spaces in that would be a better better solution a better planning solution um, but I don't know if Chris has got anything else to add on it um, Steve yeah, just thinking that uh, you can actually have some green car parking spaces, can't you? Certain, you know, covering that grass goes through. Chris, how many more spaces could you get on there, do you think? Uh, I'm not sure off the, the top of my head um, how many you'd, you'd get on there. Just trying to, so I've got a zoomed in version on my laptop. Uh, probably six to eight maybe maybe ten to the um use this mouse sorry to that's what i'm looking at this area here but then you we are going nearer the residential properties that are here which could be more of an issue in terms of noise and vehicle movements and things like that as well as other matters i mentioned about the amenity earlier and the visual impact i don't know if this space here uh, again that may be a bit bit difficult but i mean councillor piccolo's quite right we we can only work within the red line area we can't go into the sports pitch um, and if they amended the red line, which they could do, you're going to have an objection then from Sport England for the lot for in eating into those sports pitches. So I wouldn't advise doing that. Yeah, but then you might not have an objection from me because I'm just trying to solve this problem that we have in front of us. Um, and ultimately, it's, it's, it's down to us, isn't it? Um, I was going to suggest, I'm, I'm not in plain terms, but what, I'm, what about underneath the buildings? I mean, that's a fantastic suggestion that, I mean, obviously that's incredibly expensive. I know, I know, I mean, that depends on, 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 on the, the, the applicant. So eight to 10 is not going to do it. Eight to 10 additional space is not going to do it. Whether they go underground, I don't know. Maybe we at least give them that, that, that option. Um, well, there, there is the, the podium parking that's proposed here, whether there could be more podium parking using the existing parking layout, maybe an option that we could explore with the applicant and the agent. Um, we can obviously find out more details about that parking podium and ensure that if it is the application is deferred and comes back to another planning committee, okay, that we so have full details right. on that so the members okay. are clear about what that involves in terms of your decision making. Okay then, so how about this? How about we, we defer and we see what they come back with, but it has to be good otherwise. But that's just really giving everyone the, the benefit to see if we can make this project. We want to make it work, but it absolutely cannot impact that, that, that main road. I don't mind a little bit of parking. I don't mind, you know, if it gets busy, it gets busy. I get that. But it, it absolutely cannot be in a scenario where residents are parking on that main street. So you, we're looking at at least 20, maybe 30. So let's see what, what's possible. What, what's everyone think on that? Happy for a deferral? Yeah. 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 No further comments? Yeah, Councillor Brown. If we go to Sports England and say there's no club if this bill don't go on, surely they will no. jump through hoops to say change something. Because they're not going to turn down a, a sports club of that nature with everything that's going for it just because there's a couple of spaces there. So look at the football pitch. They have to look at it favourably, surely. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult one. I mean, look, the football pitches are important, but they're not in use. So when we're looking at upgraded facilities, we're only really looking at, uh, unfortunately, what, what have we got there that we haven't got now? And that is, the, and that is an improved badminton facility. But look, and obviously there's, there's, there's some other stuff in there. Okay, look, I'll tell you what, let's go for a deferral and let's see what can be done in that time. I suggest the applicant and the county take your time, but I wouldn't rush it back next month. I really want to see detail and I want to see a lot more parking. Let's see what we can come up with, okay? Yeah, all right. Uh, so I would, uh, I'd recommend um, a deferral. Uh, I need a seconder. Councillor Fletcher. And uh, okay, so what we'll do, this is a, a deferral for uh, the applicant and the council to go away and, and come up with something serious, uh, a good level of parking on this site. Now that, that, it could be that the application changes, it could be you look at Leslie units, I don't know. It could be underground parking, which, is, which, which was raised. But absolutely, it needs to be a lot more better. Otherwise, we'll just we'll just reject it next time it comes back. Okay, so that's seconded. Uh, all those in favour of deferral, please raise your hands. All right then. I think that's I think that's the right result. I think that's fair on everyone. It's important we take our time with this stuff because once it's built, it's, it's there for life. Okay, so we defer. Come back at another time to see what uh, we can work with. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that's uh, application reference twenty stroke zero zero five nine two stroke OUT uh, has been deferred to a later date. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, do you want a brief break, a uh, couple of minutes, and then we'll go on to the final two items on the uh, agenda. If anyone needs a toilet break, please use it now. Okay, thank you, uh, members, uh, for that, and thank you for those who are uh, streaming uh, at home. Okay then, that now takes us on to the last two items on the uh, uh, committee this evening. And uh, we have item 11, which is 20 stroke 01709 stroke FUL, land to the rear of Ballantyne Sports Centre. Um, uh, Councillor Akinbu, I understand you won't be taking part in this uh, presentation, is that correct? Correct, um, Chair. I will not be able to participate in this segment as I publicly make my opinion known and I've objected to the development, therefore I'll be sitting next to Councillor Augustine Ononaji, who will be presenting the reason for objection. Perfect, thank you very much for that. All right then, so with that, um, let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, Matt, if you'd be so kind as to present the report, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, the application before you seeks full planning permission for 344 dwellings, um, and those are apartments um, in buildings between five and seven stories. The summary of the application and the components of the application is set out at the table at um, paragraph 1.1 on page 95 of the agenda. There's a couple of housekeeping, housekeeping items before I uh, get into it. So we've had uh, three late objections. I'm not going to go through all of them. Basically, they, they re reiterate points which have all been, been made and have been uh, reported on the agenda. And we've had an updated response from the Council's Urban Design Officer. So within the report, there's a, a summary of their previous comments. Since uh, their earlier comments, the applicant um, has sought to amend some of the elevation details to overcome some issues about sunlighting and daylighting. Um, in summary, again, because I'm not going to read through um, you know, a, a page with quite a lot of detail. So in summary, the, the, the points which the urban designer originally made still stand. So there's still an objection um, to uh, the application on urban design grounds. So uh, if I go through the presentation, funnily enough, it's immediately opposite the site you considered about two hours ago. Uh, so it's, it's on the southern side of the 1306. Uh, so outlined in red in front of you there, so you've got the Sainsbury's Superstore off there to the east. You have Ballantyne's Health uh, and Leisure Centre to the south. Um, Trelawney Court, which is a residential block to the west. The A1306 running across the north. The wider area, you've got the, the built-up area of... <laughs> Oops. Right, OK. <laughs> Breathe a sigh of relief. You've got the built-up area of uh, Chafford 100 to the uh, south there. You can make out the suburban nature and the, and the uh, uh, green belt, funnily enough, to the north there with the coach park and um, uh, there's a sports facility as well on the northern side. And then you've got uh, along the sort of 
Well, at Western Edge, you've got the railway line, which is a single track line between, uh, that would be Grays to, no, it wouldn't, it would be Chafford Hunter to Ockenden, that section. I should know because I use it now and again. And that's uh, um, an aerial, so again, just picturing that context. Uh, and the site we're talking about is that rectangle roughly in there, and you can make out some buildings and some uh, hard standings, which I'll refer to in a little bit. That's a proposed site plan. I'll get more into the detail in a minute, but that's, that's basically to show you the form of the residential blocks which are being proposed. So they're part quadrangle blocks, um, two of them referred to as A and B. Uh, that's a basement plan. So um, the history to the site is that there was a permission from about 2009 uh, which was implemented, uh, and that involved the construction of a basement car park. Um, that basement car park remains, so the proposals in front of you now would reuse and extend that basement car park to provide car parking. Again, the details of how many spaces are within the report. That's a ground floor plan, so you can make out the outline of two perimeter blocks, A and B there. The entrance to the basement car park would be off that hammerhead there and down the ramp there. And then at surface level, you'd have car parking in a position there and along the southern boundary. Landscape courtyard areas in between the blocks uh, within the blocks and also in between the blocks. Um, I'm not going to show you all, the, all the, the plans because there's an awful lot of them because of the story heights, but that's the left-hand block, ground, um, uh, ground floor, the left-hand block there. Um, at ground floor level, you'd get the usual bin storage, cycle storage, etc., etc., with the residential floors above. So that's a, a, a sort of generic layout for the first or third floor with the residential um, apartments, and you'll make out balconies, etc., on the outside. Similar for um, Block B, so that'll be the right-hand block. Uh, again, non-residential accommodation, bin storage, etc., cycle storage at ground floor, and then above residential apartments, which are then replicated as we go through the floors. And in terms of elevations, these don't look too great on the screen, unfortunately, but that's just to point out that the heights we're talking about, which range between uh, four, five, eight, and ten story for block A, uh, six, eight, nine, and ten story for block B. So the northern elevation, the top one, that's you looking from the 1306. If you imagine the 1306, which is non, on an embankment, well, it's not on an embankment, actually, the site is at a lower level, it's not an embankment. So if you imagine the 1306 wasn't there, so that's the view you'd get, and the, the bottom view would be looking from the health centre, the health club in the other direction. East and west elevation, so the top one um, is from the Sainsbury side, the bottom one is from Trelawney Court side, so you can make out the various um, story heights for the various segments within the two blocks. Um, I mentioned the planning history because it is it forms part of the context. Obviously you're judging this application on its individual merits tonight, but there is some context. There was permission in 2009 for 140 units with a doctor surgery, that's a very basic information for that application. So the, the implemented permission, so that was started, but not finished. Um, that's the ground floor plan. Um, it was a mix of dwelling houses and flats in a sort of inverted U, um, E shape, I think we refer to. And that was a range of story heights, um, two to three, up to five story. There's a live planning permission this committee considered an application submitted in 2016. It was considered by a committee in 2017 for 203 units, so not 140, it went to 203, also with a doctor's surgery and also with some ground floor mixed use, A1, A2, A3, A4, 5, so shops, etc. That's the layout from that um, particular uh, approval. That hasn't been started, it's just on the books. It's actually running out of time to start it, but it, as, we, as things stand, it counts as a live planning commission. And those are some of the visuals from that, um, that scheme. Uh, so that was um, a range of story heights, not as high as what's being proposed now. I think that went from about four, five story up to part seven, I think it, it, uh, I think it is. Um, that's what you're looking at now. So. That's a, a photo montage from the applicant. Top view is the existing, so that's from the roundabout. Howard Road's off there to the left, um, and the bottom image is the south uh, western corner of the development, so you can make out before and after. That's a, a more long distance view from Pilgrim's, the Pilgrim's Lane roundabout. So Pilgrim's Lane is off there to the 
right. The Sainsbury's is behind that tree there, basically. So we're going top image, bottom image, and you can just begin to make out some of the height which is being proposed. But that's at probably uh, 400, 500 metres, something like that. So that's a, a, a more distant view. That's a close-up view from the 1306. So that's looking along the 1306 back towards Sainsbury's. Again, top is existing, bottom is proposed, and you can make out the story house up to 10 storey and how that would appear. Um, and I think there might be one or two more. So again, that's uh, from the roundabout which leads into the Sainsbury. So again, you can make out the health centre, existing top view, proposed bottom view, and you can make out, again, the massing, the height of the buildings which are being proposed in that context. I'll stop there and go on, uh, quickly go through the planning issues. So in terms of the principle, i.e. residential development, that's been accepted already. There are two planning permissions, one of which has been implemented. So there's no issue about the the principle of residential development. Um, indeed, the MPPF national planning policy refers to boosting housing supply, and members will be, will be aware from previous committee meetings the council does not have a five-year housing land supply. And also, in terms of the government's um, housing delivery test, the most recent uh, figures from 2020, again, emphasises we have an undersupply. So that is an issue. Um, and in that context, ordinarily, uh, what's called the tilted balance. So that's the presumption in favour of sustainable development would engage. So basically where, the council, where a council doesn't have a five-year housing land supply, um, the presumption in favour of development would normally apply. But there is a caveat on that, which is, and I'll quote it, uh, unless the adverse, ad adverse impacts of development would significantly and demonstra demonstrably outweigh the benefits. So that's the balance. We need to provide new housing, but there is a balance here. Um, going on to issues of layout and design, um, in the report we've mentioned density, it's fairly high, but on its own that really doesn't mean a lot. So the density of this particular scheme is about 320 dwellings per hectare, compared with the implemented scheme, um, that was about 127, and compared with the approval from three years ago, that was about 184. So it's, it's an increase in density, but on its own that's pretty meaningless as a, as a figure, because it's all about the context and what's, what's surrounding and how would it appear. So again, going back to what the MPPF says, it's about making best use of land and maximising the potential of sites to take pressure off the Greenbelt, for example. But there is a balancing act. And we also need to be concerned about maintaining character and the setting. Um, local plan, sorry, local plan policies, core strategy policies also refer to that balance. Now, as a matter of judgment, you've seen some of the images, we've considered that this is a very intensive use of the site. It is high density. It results in very tall buildings. And in, in, in terms of the character, although there are some large format buildings there, obviously the Sainsbury's is a, a large format building, a big floor plate, and the Ballantines is a, also a big floor plate. The story heights being proposed are out of that, out of character, given that context, even with maybe four, four and a half storey equivalent for Ballantines and Sainsbury's. So within that context, up to ten storeys we consider would be out of character. Um, landscape and visual impact is also a fairly important consideration um, given the consideration of height, but given, but given we're looking at buildings potentially up to 10 storeys in height. So I've mentioned um, the current proposals range between 4 and 10 storeys. The earlier permission was 2 to 5 storeys, um, and the live planning permission from 2017, 2018 goes up to 7 storeys. Now, although you should be taking a, um, a decision tonight on the merits of this case, those previous applications do provide some context for you. The Council's core strategy policy, PMD3, refers to tall buildings, and we give an assessment against that policy um, at pages 115, 116 of the um, report. We've considered that the scheme would fail to respond positively to those uh, criteria within the Council's own policy. Now, I've, I've shown you some visuals. It is a matter of judgment, like, in, like everything, but we've considered that as seen from the 1306, so I'll just go back a couple of slides too far. So that view there, our view is that as seen from that vantage point, um, the proposals would appear visually dominant, even with the mitigating impact of the fact that the site is at a slightly lower level than the 1306. Even with that mitigation, it's still a tall building, given um, what's there at the moment and given the surrounding context. Um, 
it's also the case that some of these views from the southwest and southeast, so ignore, sorry, that one, let's uh, more medium. So, for example, that view there, which is from the southwest, given what's um, there at the moment, and even given the context and the background of what the council has already approved, that would appear visually jarring and out of character. And I think one more, yeah, that view there, again, that's from a public vantage point, that's from a public footpath, compared to what's there, compared to what the council has already been approved, it would be intensive, it would be visually jarring. So we've considered there would be visual harm um, as a result of the height and the bulk and the massing. It is accepted that longer distance views, um, the harm would be less and wouldn't be enough to refuse plan permission. And the applicant has indeed put in a landscape and visual impact assessment to make that particular point. In terms of amenity, so with existing residential properties, there's only the one residential development to the West Trelawney Court. The position of the buildings proposed is very similar to what was proposed previously, so we haven't really raised an objection to that one. The applicant has submitted a sunlight and daylight assessment, and they've considered the impact on the, those neighbouring properties, and it is satisfactory. It ticks the box. However, that assessment also considers potential future occupiers within this development, and as originally proposed, although um, a number of the rooms were satisfactory in terms of daylight and sunlight scores. There were a number which were unsatisfactory. So what the application, what the applicant did, is revise the scheme to try and address that point. It's still the case, however, that about 6.4% of the rooms, which is about 48 rooms, on the numeric sunlight and daylight test, and I'm not going to bore you with the details of how to do a sunlight and daylight test because it is quite dry. Um, that even by the applicant's own assessment, a number of the rooms, about 6.5% of the rooms, aren't satisfactory. So there's a judgment, again, about maximising the use of the site, getting best, value, getting use, getting use, best used out of the site, all the rest of it, maximising density within reasonable limits. But because a number of the, ro the rooms are below that standard, that is a failure, and we think that's a reason for refusal. Turning to highways briefly, we've given a fairly detailed comparison of the various previous schemes within the uh, report on page 121. The current proposals for car parking are within the range which is set out in the Council's uh, 2012 draft standards, which has been referred to earlier in the, um, early into, uh, early in the uh, agenda. Um, it is a site which is within a one kilometre walking distance of Chepard Hunter Station, and it is a site which is served by uh, five bus routes. I checked a little bit earlier. So you've got bus routes along 1306, and you've got bus routes along Burley Road, I think, as along the southern boundary. So it is a fairly well-connected site, and there are some amenities locally. There's a health centre, there's, a, there's the Sainsbury Superstore, for example, for example. So it's not an isolated location. The car parking ratio for the residential element, if you compare it to what was approved by this committee in 2017, it's virtually the same. <laughs> it reduces slightly from 0.7 spaces per unit to 0.6. Given the mitigation proposals, so um, the applicant has offered um, financial contributions towards um, junction improvements locally, also a car club, and also a potential uh, extension to the um, control parking zone, because there are weight and restrictions locally in existence. Given that context, we don't think that would form a reason for refusal based on car parking, though it's accepted that as a judgment. Briefly on the final items, noise and air quality. Obviously, in terms of noise, you've got the A1306, which is heavily trafficked. That is a factor. Mitigation would be required to make an, an, uh, an acceptable internal uh, living environment and also those external spaces to make sure they're reasonable as well. But uh, the Council's EHO is satisfied that subject to... Um, mitigation by condition, there's no objection, and there are no air quality um, objections to this application. There are also no flood risk objections to this application. Turning to viability very, very briefly, so the council standard policy says for residential development, we should be asking for 35% affordable housing. That is subject to viability. Now, yeah, that's the council's own policy. That's, that, that's, that's your policy, putting it bluntly. Um, that's what the council's been... Um, Council has accepted, and it's, it's also a fact that you know, national policy also says we have to take into account viability. So the applicant has submitted a viability assessment, um, and that, in, that concludes there would be a negative land value. Um, that has been independently assessed, um, and that came through a couple of weeks ago now, and al albeit there's some 
devil in the detail about build costs and all the rest of it. Broadly speaking, the council's independent uh, assessment is that the scheme is unviable. However, um, in line with the MPPF, uh, the applicant has offered 10% um, affordable housing um, on site, and that would be affordable, 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 affordable home ownership. So there are various components of affordable housing, and discounted market sale does count as affordable housing. So the applicant is offering that, and that means that the scheme is MPPF compliant in that respect. There would be contributions to highways, as you've just heard, and there would be contributions toward health care and education. Um, however, we're not recommending planning permission be granted because of the intensity of the use, because of the density, because of the height of the buildings, because of their visual impact and because of their impact and character and also because of the internal daylighting and sunlighting arrangements for a number of the units. So putting all that together, you have a recommendation to refuse planning permission. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, that opens us up to questions. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, Steve Taylor. Ah, dodgy button, thank you. Um, so that, that was from the original application. Then I seem to recall at some point the site that was part built out before the builder went um, skint was caught fire and it's had various other things. But that underground part that you showed, does it just go under that block or does it extend more broadly under the site? You might be able to make it. So, yeah, you're right about the, the history and that the 2009 planning permission um, included the basement car park, as did the 2018 permission, as does the current one. It would, it would be, there would be some extension work to it. And, and because it was built um, probably 2010, 11 time, and it's been exposed to the elements, um, for a number of years, there would probably need to be remedial works to make it um, sound in any case. Um, and that, that, has effect, one of the, that has affected viability. I mean, that is one of the things, we, you know, as, a, as an aside. So um, on, the, on this one, you can make out, so the footprint of the two proposed blocks are basically those grids there. Um, so it would be, uh, the underground park, car park is, um, I'm basically partly underneath the southern part of those two blocks. So again, that block there, that's it, which wraps around there. So um, it doesn't cover the whole site, no. Um, and it, it, there is a podium on top of it. So there's usable space on top of um, the basement car park. And funny enough, I stood on it a few years ago. So you can, you know, it's a properly engineered reinforced concrete and all the rest of it. But yeah, it, 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 it's, par, it, it's underneath partially underneath the footprint of those two new blocks, as you can sort of make out, there's the two blocks there. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. So that, was, that was kind of what I was trying to understand, is how far across the site that extended, which you've just shown, that, that diagram I understand now. And my other comment is, am I right in some, my question, sorry, is the other side of the, the, uh, the old A13, the 10, whatever they, we call it these days, that site there, which was the one you're quite right we discussed earlier, but am I right to say that that is still a designated greenbelt site? Yeah, correct. I mean, if I go if I go back to the aerial, um, which isn't too great, but yeah, the boundary of the greenbelt goes along the 1306. So the coach park, I'm looking across at John because I think his mate, yeah, he's nodding his head. I haven't, I haven't, I didn't read that report. Sorry, chaps. Um, but that report would have made the point that's in the green belt. And certainly that um, there's a leisure use, isn't there? There's a uh, type of football type use. Again, that well, again, that's that's appropriate in the green belt. So yes, it, it, it is green belt. And indeed, the other side of the railway line uh, is probably green belt as well. So yes, that is the the 1306 is the boundary. It's still technically green belt, yeah. Yeah, that, thanks. Was, all it was crossing my mind. Will we ever propose to put a ten story? block of apartments next to the, on the, right onto the edge of the green belt, which is effectively what that's doing, albeit it might look a bit smaller, but that's that's kind of what's happening, isn't it? It's yeah. Within, uh, it's within a very short distance of the edge of the green belt. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fair point um, in that, 
you know, development doesn't have to be in the green belt to have an effect on the green belt, and, and how a development affects openness is a is a factor. Yeah, the applicant has has recognised that, and they have, they have put in a landscape and visual impact assessment. So there are verified views from the green belt, you know, from the wider green belt, and certainly from medium, longer distance views, you know, 500 metres, kilometre, etc. You wouldn't you wouldn't pick up on it because of changes in levels, because of vegetation. You wouldn't pick up on it. So. Yeah, the, the impact is more immediate. If you were travelling along the 1306 in a car or you're waiting for a bus because there are bus stops there or on the cycle lane, it would be more immediate. I think that, that, that impact, that visual harm would decrease as you went further away into the green belt. Um, but it, we haven't flagged it as harm to the green belt per se because it is a, is a judgment. I mean, there's enough in terms of immediate harm from standing on the 1306, if you like. No, that's, that's fine. No, I understand. I just wanted to check. Thanks, Matt. Okay, thank you. Um, any further questions? No? Okay. Um, oh, Councillor Polly. Sorry, Chair. I just wanted to say thank you very much to the officers. I think this is a fantastic report. And, and I think they, they've... I haven't got any questions, so everything's covered in the report. But thank you. Brilliant. Okay. All right, then. So there's... Um, there's no further questions there, I don't think. So that now takes us to the um, speaker statements. Uh, and uh, Wendy, I understand we have a, um, a statement of objections from a Gem Gemma Lowry, who's a resident, and will she be joining us virtually? Yes, thank you. Hi, Gemma. If you can hear me on Teams, do you want to just present your speaker statement, please? Is that sorry? Gemma, are you ready to present your speaker statement? I am, yes. OK, thank you. Um, Gemma, you've got three minutes in which to present your, uh, rep uh, your presentation. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, thank you. please go ahead. I'm going to speak to you to make you aware of my objections to this really large development behind Valentine's. My first objection is on the grounds that this development is not in keeping with that of Chaffer Hundred. There are no buildings here exceeding four storeys in height. And with up to 10 storeys, this will make it especially out of character within the community. In fact, I believe it will be an eyesore. My second objection is to the pressures that this is going to be placing on our existing roadways and the access to the Chapter 100. Fleming Road, which is opposite Bannatyne's Gym, is one of the main access routes into Lakeside Shopping Centre, which is used daily by locals, workers and shoppers. This is already heavily congested at multiple times every day. This congestion is especially heavy through peak times, weekends and during school holiday periods. This leads to a huge increase in traffic around Shepherd 100, multiple delays in local travel, as well as an increase of traffic through central Shepherd 100 itself in an attempt to avoid traffic through Fleming Road and London Road, which is just over in West Burrock. When there's an issue with the Dartford Crossing, the M25 or the A13, this also has a significant impact on residents and shoppers and staff for Lakeside which frequently leads to standstill traffic. There have been numerous occasions whereby traffic has queued in excess of 45 minutes to get from one side of Chapter 100 to the other. On some occasions, it leads to residents abandoning their cars and then returning them to collect them once the traffic disperses. The idea of building a further 344 dwellings in what is already a notorious traffic hotspot is absurd. If we were to consider the majority of homeowners or tenants will have at least one or two vehicles, this is going to potentially lead to another 344 to 688 vehicles. Further to this, I wonder where people will actually be parking these vehicles. It's already a concern for residents of Chapter 100 that there are far too many cars for this area. This will lead to a large overspill of vehicles from this new development 
needing to park their vehicles on side streets in 2200. Some issues this causes are misbin collections and lack of access for emergency services and deliveries. My third objection is in relation to the pollution this will bring to Chapel 100. With such an increase of homes, people and vehicles, the pollution levels will increase exponentially. This is totally unacceptable for Chapel 100. Pollution has already been proven to be a key contributor to health concerns for asthma, just as an example. My fourth objection is concerns for the lack of doctor places within Dr. Chapel 100. Many residents are unable to secure appointments within reasonable timescales, which is in part due to the lack of services within, within the area. With the likely addition of a thousand new people trying to access the existing services, the residents are going to suffer the effects. My fifth objection is a lack of school spaces available. Jeff 100 schools are already oversubscribed with local children being forced out of the area, sometimes resulting in families sending siblings to multiple schools. By building such a large development, this situation will only become worse and result in residents feeling they're forced out of the community they love, so their children are able to access good and local education. Now, personally, I love living in Chafford 100. I love the feeling of community, but constantly building more developments, especially such inappropriate ones like this, is taking away the charm and that community. A more appropriate use of this land would be a new medical centre, a dental surgery, a park, outdoor tennis and basketball court, something for the residents, not something to cause such a negative impact on an already overcrowded community. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Um, I will now move on to um, the, uh, the second presentation which is uh, from uh, Councillor Onaji, uh, who's the Ward Councillor for uh, South Chafford. Uh, you have three minutes in which to present your uh, case. Thank you. Good evening, um, Councillor Kelly and everyone here. Uh, my name is uh, Councillor Onaji. I represent South Chafford with Councillor Abe Akinbon. I speak on behalf of the residents of South Chafford on the above matter being debated today. Having widely consulted the residents, we totally object the development of 10 storeys buildings of 344 flats with 180 parking spaces in Howard Road. Our reasons for objection are, one, we believe that a cluster of tower blocks up to 10 storeys in height is totally out of character with the townscape of Chafford 100. We believe that these towers will be overbearing and could overshadow homes in Gaybat Road and the neighboring streets, thus invading the privacy to properties within the close vicinity. Two, that the proposal being residential homes would lead to unacceptable effect on the local amenities. We believe that 344 flats with just 180 parking spaces, we cause highway and parking nightmare in an area that is already heavily oversubscribed with parking. This subsequently will result to vehicles being displaced on street to the detriment of highway safety and the safe flow of traffic on the local roads. Number three. Chafford 100 is already severely oversubscribed in all infrastructure amenities such as schools, doctor surgeries. This proposal will further intensify the issues and impact negatively on residents as well as their well-beings. Number four, the proposed scheme would negatively impact on the biodiversity of the area given that Chafford 100 is based upon natural reserve. We believe that this proposal could damage the countryside look of the area. Five, we therefore propose that because of 
it is in we therefore oppose the proposal because it is in compliance with Torok local development framework, core strategy and policy for management of development, abbreviated PMD, as amended in 2015. It states one, A, PMD one, which we are relying on, states that development will not be permitted where it would have an unacceptable impact on the amenities of the neighboring occupiers. B, PMD2 mandates that all designs and layout proposal should respond to the sensitivity of the site and its surrounding and must contribute positively to the character of the area in which it is proposed and should seek to contribute positively to local views, townscape, heritage assets, and the natural futures and contribute to the creation of a positive sense of place. C, PND3 ensures that tall buildings are developed in appropriate location, are of high quality design, and can be shown to make positive contribution to the landscape and the quality of life of residents. D, PND8 requires all development to provide sufficient level of parking. E, PND9 focuses around the congestion of traffic, road work, particularly in the A13, and on key local areas. There's a potential of this worsening with the growth of the new development. Finally, we believe that the former planning permission for approximately 203 units with an additional GP surgery is favorable provided it is in line with the council's relevant core strategy and policy for management and development. On behalf of the residents, I present this statement for rejection. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, case. Um, okay then, uh, Wendy, uh, we have one more statement uh, on this item and that's uh, Tim Bell, who's the agent's representative and I understand he'll be joining us virtually. Uh, Wendy, can you make contact? Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Chair. In Sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, this application seeks to deliver 344 homes on a derelict brownfield site which would make a major contribution towards the authority's five-year housing land supply. Consequently, this major scheme would reduce the need to build on Greenbelt. The site is close to uh, Chafford 100 Station and local amenities such as Sainsbury's, Bannatine's Gym, pubs and Lakeside. And our site really is, in that sense, a truly, truly sustainable location. And it really does reduce reliance on everyday car use, unlike some of the other communities in other parts of the borough. The site delivers 201 parking spaces, which is a very slight improvement on the ratio of spaces per home compared to the existing consent. But also it's recognised that these days fewer people want to own a car for various reasons, particularly those who don't use a car to commute. And the scheme includes a car club, which has five cars for residents to use. And this is proving to be an innovative, popular service across London and the UK which operators are confident will work in Chafford. In terms of the uh, medical centre requests, the NHS has stated to the developer and the team that they don't actually want to uh, provide uh, a centre in this location, but the developer has nonetheless offered to pay a financial contribution towards a new centre in the vicinity and indeed a similar contribution for education. So these points are recognised. Architecturally, the design responds to the identity of Chafford. The homes focus on two sun-filled courtyards with white brick, which is reminiscent um, of the, uh, sorry, which is reminiscent of, lost my screen. Sorry, one second. Um, reminiscent of the, of the uh, quarries 
and equally the landscaping around the perimeter is reminiscent in terms of its specification of the uh, Mardike and the greenery and the landscaping beyond. So I think in summary, this is uh, an opportunity for the council to achieve a lot of new homes without having to resort to Greenbelt. Um, and we very much recommend this scheme uh, to um, members for consideration, please. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, based on those uh, presentations that we've heard, are there any further questions? Uh, looking around the room. Um, no, no one's got their hand up. Okay. All right then. So uh, we've got the presentations there. <laughs> Uh, we'll now move into a uh, debate. Uh, did anyone want to start the debate this evening? Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, Chair. What occurs to me, uh, too much development, too few car parking spaces, old Ford site, same routine. OK, thank you. Uh, any further comments on this one? Uh, no, okay, no further comments. Um, okay, so uh, I was a member of the committee uh, uh, for 2017 and I was one of the members that approved uh, the original application on this particular site. I must admit I was, I was very nervous when I came out of that meeting wondering whether I'd, I'd done the right thing or not. Um, and, and I must admit, yeah, I'm, I'm still not sure to this day whether it was the right decision, but nevertheless that, that, planning, commission, uh, that planning commission is still live. Uh, looking through some of the, uh, the statements here, um, I know the last uh, development had a GP surgery. It says here, um, obviously the NHS has said that uh, uh, a GP surgery at this location no longer fits its, uh, the strategic vision for the local area. I don't like that from NHS. Very rarely they, they frustrate me, but that, that, that does frustrate me from them because clearly um, you know, there is a need in this particular area for that. Um, we've heard it again uh, this evening earlier on, the car club. And I understand it works very well across London, but you know we're not London, we're Essex, we're not there yet. So these types of schemes we want to try and avoid if we can. Uh, you know we're not, as, as I said, we're outside the M25. So look, it's it it is way too much for this particular area. Um, there's absolutely no way, certainly not when if we want to be consistent. And we looked at those previous applications when we look across the road at what we've done earlier on uh, this evening with that deferral. Um, there's absolutely no doubt that this is, this is way too much. So there's, there's not too much for me to add here. I think that the uh, uh, Councillor Polly was right. The, the officer's presentation was very well detailed. Um, th there's nothing more for me to add. Um, there is a recommendation set out on page 71. If, if, was there any further comments before we go to the vote? Um, no. Okay, so let's look at page... Um, have I got that right? Page 71? That doesn't sound right, does it? Huh? 1.30. Here we go. One thirty, and that's a recommendation uh, for refusal. Uh, would anyone like to recommend refusal? Councillor Fletcher, is that that's seconded by Councillor Lydiard? Okay, all those uh, in favour of refusing uh, based on reasons one and two, uh, set out on 8.1 on page 130, please raise your hands. Okay, and uh, that's a unanimous uh, rejection across the committee. Okay, so uh, we can say that 20 stroke 01709 stroke FUL um, has been refused. Um, okay, which takes us on to the last item on the agenda, which is 13, remembering of course that item 12 has been withdrawn. And this is um, uh, Wick's Place, uh, Wick, Wick, Wick Place Cottage in Brentwood Road, Bolvan. Um, and that's found on pages 165. Nadia. I understand you're covering this one. Thank you. So I'll take your time. I know you're going to set that up. I will start again. Apologies, I was focusing on the wireless mouse, forgetting the mic. Good evening, members. 
this application has been called in to committee by councillors in order to consider the impact upon the Greenbelt. There are no further updates for members since the publishing of this agenda. The site, as you can see, is located to the eastern side of the old Brentwood Road outside of the village of Bulvan. A few images of the site will follow. So the site is just there. You can see the cursor. This is looking north up Brentwood Road with the site on your right. There's the main dwelling at Wick Place Cottage. A couple of images of the former smithy there in the centre. And the overall site frontage. And the smithy again there. And this is opposite the site to the west of the old Brentwood Road which lies the recently built out Bonham Grange development. And some views from within the site, the rear of the existing dwelling and its immediate rear garden area, the three bay garage within the site. That's the rear view of the smithy from within the site and some views of the northern half of the site. And some views of the frontage and views looking generally north there. So this slide shows the existing, uh, the, uh, the elevation of the existing former smithy. The proposal seeks the removal of four outbuildings within the site and the replacement of the former smithy with a chalet dwelling in the centre, along with the erection of a third chalet dwelling to the northern half of the site. So that would be where the smithy building would be replaced, and that's the additional dwelling there to the north. Here's an elevation of the proposed replacement dwelling on the site of the smithy. It would be a four-bedroom chalet. It should be noticed that, noted that this is not a conversion, but a replacement of the smithy building itself. This elevation shows the plans and elevations of the, th of the third dwelling to the north, which will be a three-bed chalet dwelling. And the most useful image here is the bottom of the plan, which shows the street scene imagery with the existing two-storey dwelling, the replacement dwelling where the site of the smithy was, and the additional dwelling there the three dwellings in total. The applicant suggests that the exception under paragraph 145G applies if in that the complete, re if in that the complete redevelopment of previously development land could occur here, it would not have a greater impact or not cause substantial harm to the Greenbelt. The MPPF defines pre previously developed land as land which is or was occupied by a permanent structure including the curtilage of the developed land, and specifically the MPPF states it should not be assumed that the whole of the curtilage should be developed. This is considered to be the essence of the assessment of this application, as the northern area of the site, where the proposed dwellings would be sited, is largely open and undeveloped, as could be seen from the previous um, site images, and as such, this specific area would fall beyond the definition of previously developed land. As such, the development would be considered inappropriate in the Greenbelt and very special circumstances would be needed in order to clearly outweigh the actual harm to the Greenbelt as well as harm to openness. With respect to very special circumstances, the applicant primarily contends that the development would be acceptable on the basis of a permitted development fallback. The, the slide and plan in front of you shows the position of both the previous lawful development certificate applications which would be a two-storey rear extension, if you just see where the cursor of the mouse is there, the, uh, to the rear of the main dwelling, and a flat roof outbuilding to the rear of the northern part of the site, which was proposed to be used as a swimming pool. These were both determined in 2017 and have not been implemented and so do not exist on site. The applicant suggests that the council has given limited consideration 
to, to the permitted development fallback on the basis that the, the applications were granted three years ago. But this is not the crux of the matter. Whilst the lawful development certificates are material considerations, they would not supersede the consideration of Greenbelt principles. Furthermore, the effect of the lawful development decisions is only to grant development within the li those limitations set within the lawful development applications themselves. That is, the granting of lawful development for extensions to the main dwelling and the erection of an ancillary outbuilding that would be used in conjunction with the main use of the site as a single dwelling house. So one planning unit, not three, the subdivision into three dwellings. So this proposal seeks the subdivision of the site and is not comparable. In fact, the development would conflict with two of the purposes of the Greenbelt, C and E, that is safeguarding the countryside from encroachment and assisting in urban regeneration by encouraging reuse of urban land. In the case of policy PMD6, the intention is to ensure that the development and any extensions and alterations do not materially impact upon the open character of the Greenbelt. This approach has been supported in recent appeal decisions in Thurrock and the MPPF maintains the same approach with respect to inappropriate development in the Greenbelt. That is, to put it bluntly, lawful development certificates do not outdo the Greenbelt principle. In terms of the development plan, the proposals therefore represent inappropriate development and the PD fallback position should be given very limited weight in the assessment. The applicant's position that building the lawful development would be unsustainable is noted. However, the applicant submitted them in the first place and it is therefore assumed that the intention was there to build them. Otherwise, why submit them at all? Ultimately, the council can only consider what actually exists on site and it, in, in its weighing up of the consideration of the impact. Another reason put forward as a very special circumstance has also been considered, and that relates to the lack of a five-year housing supply. The proposals would provide only a small benefit to that housing land supply, and where there is a clear reason for refusing an application on Greenbelt grounds, there is no scope to apply this very special circumstance. All other arguments that were put forward were considered and given no weight in the balancing of the Greenbelt impact. This image provides an indication of the sight lines that could be provided for the proposals. There are no highway objections to the development subject to conditions. All other matters of detail in relation to and including amenity, landscaping and ecology impacts in relation to the proposals would be considered acceptable. However, these would not overcome the in-principle objection to the inappropriate development and the harm caused to openness in the Greenbelt. The application is summarised for members here and it's recommended to you for refusal. Okay, thank you, Nadi. Thanks for that uh, presentation. Um, okay, then, this now opens us up to questions. Are there any questions that members would like to ask in relation to this? No, no questions. Okay. Um, all right, then, that takes us straight to the uh, speaker's statements. And. Um, Wendy, I understand that uh, our first statement is of objection. That's a Beverly Johnson, a Johnston, sorry, who will be joining us virtually. No, Chair, I'll be reading her statement out. Okay then, uh, please read her statement out. Thank you. As a neighbour living in Brentwood Road, I strongly object to this planning application on the grounds of local and national greenbelt policy. I submitted extensive evidence to support my objections via the planning portal. To recap, the site is residential and sits in the Greenbelt. Addi additional residential dwellings on Greenbelt sites are deemed inappropriate de development. The argument by the applicant that current permitted development rights would have a greater impact on the Greenbelt than the new dwellings is immaterial. Those rights are granted solely for the incidental use by the current homeowner. Further, if the transfer of such rights is that simple in planning terms, then everyone will start doing it. Nor is the site deemed an infill site. Limited infill sites are usually restricted to the outskirts of a village, such as the, in the case of the converted garages in between manor cottages. Supporters state that the two properties address the unmet need for housing in the borough. This, not, this does not constitute a very special circumstance that would outweigh the harm caused to the Greenbelt and current openness of the site. 
plan uh, planners and committee frequently reject applications within the green belt for alterations and additions such as extensions, garages and outbuildings, which are nowhere near as large as in scale, as large in scale nor as harmful to the green belt as this application. If permission is granted for these two luxury dwellings to be built, then something is seriously amiss within thorough planning as they refuse permission for a Romani gypsy family to set up home on a redundant piece of land in the same road. That application was allowed to uh, appeal due to very special circumstances, which Forest Council did not acknowledge. If the committee do pass this application, I trust everyone living in the Forest Greenbelt will be allowed to allowed to do likewise. Okay, thank you. Uh, that now takes us on to uh, a statement of support from Councillor Barry Johnson, who's the Ward Councillor. Uh, Wendy, will he be joining us virtually? Yes. Excellent. Okay, um, if you could just uh, make contact. Councillor Johnson, do you want to present your statement? Thank you, Wendy. Good evening, members of the committee, and thank you, Chair, for allowing me time to speak in favour of this application. I requested the application be called into committee as the site is clearly of a high quality design, not only delivering carbon neutral essential family living, but also supplying a property that offers flexible living, which could easily be adapted for elderly or possibly even disabled residents. The application also breathes life into a much cherished local historical building in the form of the Smithies outbuilding, which is to be lovingly restored, bringing back many aspects of the original building into play. I believe the site proposers have paid attention to the committee's past deliberations and as well as the previous examples have taken into consideration the need for a sustainable site by way of ensuring each property will be equipped with an electric vehicle point. I would also like to point out that contrary to the original report parking standards have actually been exceeded whilst reducing the hard standing area which runs from front to back of the original property. If the committee would care to cast their minds back to virtually all other applications within Baldwin, I'm sure you will recall numerous comments against the proposals. However, I would ask you to note that comments in favour of this application vastly outweigh by 10 to 1 against any comments against it, which I think backs up my claim that local people are happy to see the old building being restored to a high degree of beauty. And I would like to think that this committee do listen to local people. The report correctly states that this site is within the Green Belt. However, I think it is important to point out that the whole application lies within the curtilage of a residential property, which already has permission by way of permitted development to build substantially larger outbuildings than those proposed within this development, with only soft landscaping suggested between each property, which negates the suggestion that the site increases residential land. I find it extremely hard to accept that this site has any significant effect on the openness of the Greenbelt when you consider the site less than 20 metres away on the opposite side of Brentwood Road, which you saw in the pictures earlier, is, which is currently undergoing the erection of 19 very large houses. I believe the site does satisfy planning rules by way of partial redevelopment of previously developed land, and it is not situated near any towns, so it certainly doesn't seem to apply that unrestricted spot sprawl will be likely. I believe very special circumstances to outweigh any harm to the Greenbelt have clearly been provided, with the site being sympathetically designed to enhance the street view and offer good quality, sustainable accommodation in a semi-rural setting whilst restoring a former historical building. In my opinion, this application ticks a lot of boxes in regards to Thorak's needs and aspirations. So I say thank you for listening, members, and I'm sure you will make the correct decision. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then that now takes us on to uh, the last uh, statement, uh, which is uh, a statement of support from a James Wiley and that's uh, Democratic Services to read out. Wendy, obviously you've got three minutes, so do your best with that, thank you. The single recommended reason for refusal states that the proposal constitutes inappropriate development and that the very special circumstances submitted do not outweigh this harm. 
very special circumstances have been provided and it is respectfully considered that the aggregation of these factors was not given sufficient weight in the officer's assessment of this application. Officers have afforded very little weight to a permitted development fallback position which has been conclusively de demonstrated through the issuing certificates of lawfulness. The suggestion that this permitted development should be afforded little weight due to the certificates being issued three years ago is considered to be misplaced as the relevant criteria has not changed and this development could be implemented tomorrow should the current or future owner of the site decide to do so. As demonstrated within the submissions and the 3D imagery provided within the application, the proposed development un unambiguously has a lesser impact on openness than the combined existing and permitted development. The proposed development therefore provides the op opportunity to safeguard against further development on this site that would cause greater harm to the openness of the Greenbelt than currently proposed. Indeed, if the permitted development bu uh, buildings were existing buildings, the proposed development could not be considered inappropriate development at all. If so, little, development, um, little weight is to be attributed to permitted development fallbacks. A very clear incentive is inevitably <laughs> created to erect buildings in the Greenbelt simply to propose their demolition. This is surely contrary, contrary, contrary to the principle of sustainable development that should run through all planning decisions. Therefore, members are respectfully requested to attribute this factor significant weight rather than the very limited weight given to this factor by officers to prevent such an incentive being created. In addition to this factor, the proposal will also provide two new dwellings on an existing residential site in the context of a severe five-year housing land supply shortfall. Indeed, officers have afforded this factor significant weight. The proposal will also provide site-specific ecological benefits as identified by the Council's Landscape and Ecology Advisor and site-specific design benefits by replacing existing poor quality outbuildings with a well-designed attractive residential development and providing free homes oh. with generous gardens and parking. Indeed, the proposed development has received a number of letters in support of many welcoming the prospect of a high-quality development on this site. Additionally, it is highlighted that the two new dwellings are proposed to be carbon neutral with specific measures set out in the design and access statement to achieve this, which can be secured by condition. It is considered that these factors, factors cumulatively amount to fairly special circumstances to outweigh any harm to the Greenbelt. Furthermore, when considering the five purposes of the Greenbelt, the development is not considered to conflict with these purposes, particularly if the aforementioned permitted development that could be implemented tomorrow is taken into consideration. The development will not result in an increase in residential land within the Greenbelt, but will ensure an existing residential site can provide free homes in the context of housing land shortfall. To prevent these benefits being realised when there will be no impact on, on the openness of the Greenbelt, if taking the permitted development into consideration would not seem logical when the exact same development would likely be regarded as acceptable if the permitted development was f were first implemented. Given the foregoing, it is respectfully requested that planning permission be granted for the proposed development so that its benefits can be realised. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Wendy, for uh, that, and thank you for those uh, statements. Uh, Councillor Fletcher, you had your hand raised. Yeah, just really, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a question, just a, a, a clarification, really. Smithy, restored or replaced? I don't see how it can be both. Completely replaced. It's not restored, it's... If, if you want, I go back, if that's okay, I can go back. Oh, wrong, wrong mouse. No, it's fine. Um, sorry, Wendy, I can't. If you don't mind, just briefly, I can just show the images to members again. Yeah, I'll stop doing anything. Thank you. I'll just go back. So that's the smithy. That's the smithy at the moment. And the dimensions, I scribbled them down earlier. So the existing the existing smithy is 16 metres wide by 5.7 metres deep. And it is 5.1 metres in height, and you can see it before you there. If we go down to the replacement, which is this structure here, in terms of its footprint, it's quite similar, um, but it would be replaced. It's 16 metres wide, 7.19 metres deep, and, and taller. It's 5.97 metres in its overall maximum height, but 
it isn't a restoration. Yes, they, are, they would be using a very similar brickwork and brick materials, but it's a different structure. It's a replacement building. Thanks, Nadia. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nadia, one uh, point that was raised was the fact that this is quite close to, um, I think it was a luxury homes development. Uh, I think it was, uh, it was approved by planning um, some years ago. What, what's your thoughts and feelings on that? I, th I suppose it's a, a fairly decent argument that when you look across the road, um, yeah, I mean, obviously you've got quite a large luxury housing complex. What was your, what was your findings on the, the, the loss of openness to the green belt? Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. I'm familiar with the history of the former Peary's Place site, which is immediately opposite and was in that triangle there. So that, that is now the Bonham Grange development that is, uh, as, as Councillor Johnson referred to, is being built out at the moment. And it was granted outline permission, if I recall correctly, I think it was April 2015, with the reserve matters following. Um, the site, that site is also in the green belt. It, it was identified as being a potential site for housing in the distant future, if I recall correctly, in the local plan. But I think because of its remote location at the time, it was never particularly brought forward. The application that then came forward as an outline for 19 dwellings demonstrated clearly very special circumstances on the basis of the number of houses, the, the particularly high quality design and choice of materials, and as well as the five-year housing supply, but there, was a ra there were a range of very special circumstances that built up an argument that clearly outweighed the harm. And I actually printed off the uh, minutes and the officer's report at that time, um, at that, just in case it came up, and it was recommended to members favourably on the basis that whilst it was finally balanced, it was considered that those very special circumstances did tip in favour of it. Members debated it and they agreed on the basis of, you know, the high quality design, the nature of the materials used and um, the number of houses proposed, which would have helped the five-year housing supply. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, as I'm looking across the site, I think that's, I think that's a fair argument that it probably wouldn't uh, affect the openness of, of, of the area. Um, but I think that's the only one I can see at the moment. Uh, Councillor uh, Polly. Thank you. Um, the, the smithy itself is a heritage building. What is, is it of any significance when it was last used as a smithy? Like the, the one at Limford is still actively being used as a smithy. just wondered what the history on the actual... Uh, um, building is please thank you thank you it's not a listed building and um the, the i understand it dates from the mid 19th century so around the 1850s and um it does form part of the site but it isn't used as a smithy at present and the applicant details within the application that the use of it at the moment is used primarily for storage you can't quite see there but the actual detail within the floor plan shows that it's used for agricultural storage. I do have some images um, of the structure um, dating back um, into the um, mid 19th century, but I, I can't put them on the um, on the display because I only found them late in the day. But I'm happy to pass them around to you if you're interested to actually see them. If, if, but but it but it's not a listed building at all. Right. Mm. Hey, Councillor Byrne. Yes, I'm struggling with this one. If you cross the road, you're going to be opening the windows. You're going to be breathing the same air as the people outside. You're going to see the same cars going along. You're going to see the same sky. And everything's identical. So how can you say yes to this one and no to this one? The only thing I'm guessing is that this one come with carrots attached. And this one is a small builder that may be no carrots attached. But there and there, it's exactly the same. I can't see how you can come up and say no. Yes, it may not safeguard the green belt, but this one, because there's lots of houses and it does a supply, yes. So surely this, there's 10 yards between it. How can, it, how can you go against it? It's impossible. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, John, did you want to come in here? Uh, yeah, sorry, there's just one more sort of unique policy hook to the Peary's Place site. Um, 
got the report in front of me again from 2015. Um, at that time, the council had been working on something called the site-specific allocations DPD. So there were a number of sites that had been put forward as part of the, the work on the local plan at that time. Um, this site was one of the sites that had been put forward, the Pierce Place site, so the Triangle site, was one of the sites that had been put forward as a potential housing site. Um, at that time, in terms of decision-making, we did give some weight to the that DPD document. So that was one of the things in combination with the others that kind of tipped it over the balance at that time, at a very distinct point in time when we were making recommendations and decisions. And there were other decisions that followed that using the same assessment of the, the DPD documents. Um, that's not something we're, we're using now. So at that point in time, 2015, this application and there were a couple of others relied on that. And in terms of the, the Pierce Place site, that was effectively what tipped the balance at that point. So the site we're considering today isn't part of any DPD document, hasn't been put forward as a call for sites for residential development. So that's a very distinct di difference between those two. Yeah, the development over the road, did that come with any, say, giveaways, carrots, or what was added, what was given on that? Nothing, it was just a build and nothing, no 106 money, no... I'm going to build a medical centre or I'm going to put a policeman outside every day. It's, is it? Yeah, was just, it? Just yeah, you can see I, mean, I, imagine, I imagine it was. I mean, look, ultimately, the, the only other thing is uh, different different committee, different times, different opinions. Oh. You know, that, that, that is to... I'll bring in Steve Taylor whilst you're looking, because obviously you're our expert on Greenbelt. What do you, what do you think, Steve? And I'll bring in uh, Councillor Fletcher. Well, I, I think the definition of an expert is um, <laughs> brings into question a few points, but I, I wouldn't go as far as that. But my understanding, unless I've completely lost the plot, um, is that we shouldn't be looking at precedents in the first place. So to talk about what was done there isn't appropriate you look at each application on its own. And the other specific difference, that other piece of land, was completely uh, landlocked by three roads. The site we're looking at, if you, if you were to look at it and look directly back, there's nothing behind it. So as you're standing in front of it, if you look at what resides behind it, that's just open. So in terms of changing the, the visual impact on the Greenbelt, it does, because you're now building two-storey, bigger bigger buildings than are currently on the site, well, two of them, because I keep getting confused in the report because it talks about two buildings and three buildings, but one of them is, is the existing building, as I understand it, so, or the existing house, I should say. So the other two buildings, you're going to pull them down, and you're going to put, put up bigger buildings. So when you look at what you're doing is you're increasing the density of that site, and if, you, if that photograph kept going back, you can go a long way and there's nothing there. So in terms of breaking into the green belt, the other bit is completely roadlocked, as you can see, and it's just on the edge of Baldwin. Now, I know it is only the other side of the road, but the, the specific difference is, as you look back, you're now looking at a big green open space, a, a very big one, which is part of the green belt. That's what it's supposed to be there for. So I, I understand what Councillor Byrne's saying, that it seems unreasonable, but I thought the premise under which we viewed applications was that you didn't view, or you didn't set precedents and you didn't say, well, because he can, I can. So that, that would be my comments, I think, unless anyone's going to tell me I'm completely barking mad, which isn't, wouldn't be the first time. Yeah, um, but yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, we had the training last week. We was told specifically, look, don't allow precedents into it. But then consistency is, imp uh, is, is, is important. So, for example, me personally, I generally, the problem looking at that, I, d I don't generally have an issue with it. I suppose the, the issue is if we if we give it the green light, if we're going to be consistent, we now then have to allow a whole row of uh, uh, houses along that stretch, and then then when do you where do you stop? So it's it's that little barrier sometimes that we have to get over. And whilst we don't take in precedence, consistency is is important. Um, Right, so what we'll do, before I bring you in, Councillor Fletcher, Matt, was you... Yeah, you sorry, I was, I was champing at the bit there. Can we'll, we'll you come to a conclusion, the Google, I think. The Google, 
the Google Earth. I'm, I, I mean, I'm, I don't, I don't know the particular history of Pira's place. Uh, John is right. It appeared on. So after the core strategy was first adopted in 2011, because it's a core strategy, it's a basic framework. What should then have happened is that um, the council should have identified a load of housing sites, a load of employment sites, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and allocate them. We started going through that process and we had consultations and they were site-specific allocations. Pyrrhus Place was promoted by a landowner as a potential um, housing site and it appeared on a document and it went to consultation. It didn't go any further than that because in 2014 we pulled the plug and we said we'll do a new local plan. So if you want my personal view about how much weight we should have put on that allocation, my personal view is probably we should put that much weight on it. That's, that's gone, it's happened. My view about that, if you look at harm, you know, the, and, and what I'm comparing it to, for example, if anybody knows Averley and the Averley Bypass development, there was a development, Persimmon built 340 houses, but it was contained between the bypass and the edge of the built-up area. So you could make an argument about there's limited harm to the wider Greenbelt. You could probably make that argument about Pyrrhus Place, constrained by the old Brentwood Road, by the A128. So the harm is contained. Just as uh, Steve Fletcher sort of made the point about what happens on the eastern side, just as a point of detail, because we have now have an application before us, so the site you see in the southwestern corner there, um, southeastern corner, sorry, bottom right, we have a live application for development in the Greenbelt. So it's, it's the, then we're into that incremental change. And I mean, I've said it before to councillors and other other. other um, officers have said the green belt is primarily a spatial designation it really doesn't matter if you can't see it and it really doesn't matter about the state of the land it's about a spatial designation and keeping land openness so what the MPPF says is it's about openness and it's about permanence so just as a point of detail we have other applications on the books just been validated for other incremental development in the area Thank you. And that land to the what was that north east south west? Did that that came to planning as well recently, didn't it? We we rejected that. Did we reject that here? Yeah. Ago? So again, I'm I'm hogging the limelight. I don't mean to. It's not my case. But the so yeah, on the left hand side of the bypass, that area in there was an application for 100 and, 115, which was refused by this committee. Went to an appeal, and that was dismissed. I think about this time last year. Yeah, just found the legal agreement for the Pyrrhus Place site. Um, at that time, we were adopting the £5,000 per unit um, planning obligation strategy. So they signed an agreement for £5,000 times 19 units. Just one question. We said we can't look at a previous app for setting a precedent, but we just brought one in. A guy over there just brought one in, said there's a planning permission coming in, so he's actually brought in something goes that way but then they're bringing something that goes that way and that you can't use it so surely there's got to be you just brought one in put in over there but there's an application gone in that shouldn't be mentioned surely well, well no I, what are you not, talking about the one north east the one in the bottom right hand corner no the one he just said there's a, an application about the oh, yeah that one in the bottom right yeah but that's that's, that's live isn't to do it with, like, that's not nothing to do with this app so why bring that one in well, I think shouldn't even be mentioned should it because it's nothing to do with this app you can't have both ways, surely. Yeah, the only point I was making, and I was just picking up the point Steve Taylor was making, there, there is, um, yeah, there's pressure development in Greenbelt, and and yeah. that is a live application. And I don't think I'm talking out of turn there. That's on the books. It's on, you well, know, then you made the point. Uh, the consultation. The one over the road, you can't judge it. So you can't not judge that one, but judge that one on it, surely. Okay. Well, um, let's. We'll. Um, I think we'll come to some sort of form of conclusion now. Mike, did you have a, an additional question? To be honest, uh, Chair, I think Steve put it better than me, but, yeah, I mean, obviously the character of the, either side of that road is very different. The thing with the green belt is it does start on one side of a road. That's what they call the edge of it. And if you're going to build on green belt, as we've said before, do it right. Do it with plan do it with uh, proper attention to infrastructure. Don't do it piecemeal. Okay, then, Councillor Piccolo. Yeah, thanks, Chair. 
Um, <coughs> I must admit, while it, when I read the report and when I looked at the, uh, the details initially, um, I, was, I was leaning towards <coughs> approval, but hearing what I've heard now about the uh, other developments that are proposed in the, in the close proximities of that, I am now concerned that it will lead to, to green belt sport. So I've actually, uh, um, I've, I've actually changed my mind during the course of this debate because of the effect. In, in isolation, it didn't appear that, it, I didn't think it would appear to have an effect, but knowing what's already pro being put forward through the rest of the area, I'm now concerned. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we're at the debate stage now. We'll, we'll, we'll reach a conclusion soon. Councillor Byrne. We just said that's no point, but Councillor Piccolo is actually not going to vote because you've mentioned that bit of appeal. So, where are we? Come on. Oh, look, everyone's entitled he's to He's actually changed on. his mind. Well, we're allowed to, aren't we? It's, it's no, he's, he just said he's changed his mind for what he said over there. No, that, that, that he wasn't. come in ready to vote for it. He's seen what might happen. Well, hang on. You can't... No. Well, I came here this evening. I didn't think I was going to vote against uh, that uh, that site for um, the coach park, and I, and I didn't think I was going to defer Springhouse. The, the whole point of, of planning, and, and one thing that has been good this evening, is that we've had the debate. We've got separate opinions. So, we've. We'll, sorry, Councillor Pickard, come in there. Yeah, come if I, I, and by all means, look back on it. But I didn't think I say I decided. I think I said I was minded to, which means I was still open to persuasion. I was very careful with the work. I was very careful with the words I used, which means I hadn't predetermined, but I was minded to consider it that way, which is two completely different things. Okay, thank you. I think it's, I think it's, it's been a good night. Um, okay, right, so um, there is a recommendation uh, on page uh, 180. Uh, that's, um, let's have a look there. That's recommendation uh, 8.0, which is to refuse. Uh, did anyone want to recommend refusal? Uh, Councillor Fletcher and uh, uh, Councillor Watson seconding uh, that. So all those uh, in favour of uh, refusal, please raise your hand. Okay. And uh, Wendy, that's unanimous across the committee. All right then, so uh, that's uh, application reference 21 stroke 00243 stroke FUL. Uh, that has been uh, refused. That's now uh, 2203, and that is now the close of the meeting. Um, thank you everyone this evening. Um, I'm, I'm slightly nervous, we've been here four hours and we've not approved a single home, but I'm sure we can, we can make up for that next, uh, next month. I think we, we really did come to some good conclusions there this evening. I think we, it was the right thing to defer for the Spring House to see them come back. I think it was the right thing to look at that travel plan and, and defer for the Coach Park. So thank you, everyone, and uh, I look forward to seeing you next month. Councillor Piccolo, did you have a quick comment? Just, just a quick one. Two applications tonight have relied on car clubs, and I'm not um, <coughs> aware of what the situation is locally other than inside London. Is it possible that some officers or someone could do a report on the effectiveness and the, the, the use of car clubs in Essex or the surrounding areas.